Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to UCL Laws. My name is Mark D'Souza, and along with my co-organizers, Matthew Dyson from Oxford, Rachel Clement Tully from Cambridge, Paul Jarvis, um, the Criminal Bar Association, I want to welcome to you, welcome you to the 13th Assize Seminar, which makes a return to UCL in a hybrid format for the first time in four years. Uh, the last time we physically hosted the seminar here was, uh, an Assize seminar here was in November 2019. We did have an online seminar in 2021, November, which UCL nominally hosted, but it's great to see you back here in person. Uh, looking around, I see some familiar faces and that's very heartening. And I see some other faces that I hope will become familiar faces as we go along. So the Assize series, uh, the Assize seminar series was designed to bring academics, the criminal bar, the solicitor's practice and the bench together to discuss ideas on the very cutting edge of the criminal law and criminal practice. And we're delighted that we have now hit the big 13. Uh, it seems like a while since we started. Um, just a couple of quick announcements to make about today's seminar. First of all, some of you may have noticed that Stephen Shute was initially on our list of presenters. He wanted to convey, he wanted us to convey to you on his behalf, his sincere regrets that he cannot make it for today's uh, seminar. Uh, he had to withdraw due to re recent bereavement. So he apologizes. He should be there for a future seminar, we hope. Secondly, the format for today is that each speaker will speak for about 25 minutes or so. And we'll be speaking to a two-page handout that you can Ten use minutes. as an aid memoir for when you so ruminate over these thought-provoking papers minutes. well after the seminar is over. After that, uh, we were told we were the speaker's presentation will be followed by two short invited comments per paper. Each comment will be about 10 minutes each. And thereafter, we will throw the floor open for questions. I will be chairing the first session. And after my initial speech, I'll be sitting over there to monitor the online Q&A session because there's questions that might be coming up, coming um, from our hybrid audience as well. But um, I will also indicate who gets to ask questions. Um, and we'll try to pass around a microphone at that time. So without any further ado, I'd like to kick us off by introducing to you our first speaker to, for today, Dr. Miranda Bevan from Goldsmiths University of London. Dr. Bevan is a lecturer in, lecturer in law, specializing in criminal law and criminal justice. She practiced as a criminal barrister for about 12 years, is that right? 12 years before coming to academia. And she spent a couple of years at the Law Commission as lawyer with responsibility for the unfitness to plead report, which was published in 2016. She's also worked as a policy associate at the Howard League for Penal Reform. And she'll be discussing her paper titled Cut Adrift in Search of Effective Participation for Children in Police Custody. You will see a handout uh, if you don't have one, just look around. They should be at the edges of each of these rows. Uh, it's a very attractive handout, with, with, which should be fairly easy to follow. Her presentation will be followed by two comments. The first by Kath Chatter, who is a senior solicitor, duty solicitor, and qualified HCA in the criminal defense team at GT Stewart. And the second comment will be by Jude Lankin, who is an associate in the crime, fraud, and regulatory team at Bindman's LLP. So, um, over to you, Miranda. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. I think I've bitten off quite a lot in this paper, so I am going to take you on a whistle-stop tour uh, through it. I will try to speak not too fast. Uh, so uh, what I want to look at today is uh, the uh, concept of effective participation as it applies to children in police custody. We've become increasingly familiar with the concept of effective participation in the trial arena. It's 30 years since Stanford in the UK and the European Court of Human Rights acknowledging, recognizing the right to participate effectively in trial. We may yet still not really appreciate the full scope of that right. Uh, Abhinav Wusu Bemp has written um, on that subject. So it's not that I'm suggesting that uh, the scope of the right is settled uh, within the trial process, but it has at least become part of the discourse. It's within the criminal procedure rules. We think of it in terms of case management, and it features in our trial adjustments test. But what of the right in the pre-charge phase? So in Panavitz and Cyprus, the European Court on Human Rights um, extended or confirmed that that right extends to pre-charge procedures. 
But what do we understand it to consist of in that setting? And that's what I want to look at today. I want to produce a sort of shorthand for what we might think of uh, that right requiring the authorities to do at that stage. I'm going to uh, compare that shorthand against some empirical findings uh, from research with children with experience of police custody. Um, I want to have a look at the impact uh, when that right isn't uh, enabled in that setting and think about the barriers to the full achievement of that right. And then I, this is very much a provocation more than a paper in this later stage, because I'm interested to know what your views might be in terms of how we might reform this area of the law. Uh, but you're stuck here in the room, but I feel that I should start really with uh, something around why I think this topic is so pressing. Why should we be thinking about this issue today? Those of you who practice or are familiar with the criminal courts will understand entirely how important the evidence that derives from the police station is at trial. Often the die is cast, is it not, uh, in terms of what is said in interview. We'll know uh, about miscarriages of justice that relate to um, uh, false uh, confessions elicited at, at the police station, particularly the Confey case in this arena. But I think even more important than that, um, as John Jackson has noted, we are moving away really from the paradigmatic adversarial process. Um, and the police station stage, the pre-charge stage, is becoming really a significant part of the adjudicatory process. And if that's right, then it's even more important that we should think about how the suspect there, how the suspect's uh, rights um, and fair trial rights are um, protected in that setting and it's especially important for children who are the focus of this paper mm -hmm. because as you'll know for good reason and the welcome um, focus on diversion particularly since the crime and disorder act 1998 uh, but uh, with that welcome focus comes the fact that we rarely have children in uh, the criminal trial process because they are often diverted out before that point. So understanding how those decisions are made about the outcomes for them is really important in my submission mm -hmm. uh, and protecting their fair trial rights in that setting is really key. It is... Uh, Police custody is far and away the most common substantive experience of the youth justice system for the majority of children who come into contact with it. They very rarely end up in trial, as I've said. And so understanding and ensuring that they are able to participate effectively in that part of the process is uh, really crucial. And in particular because, and I'll come back to this point, but it is a site of significant racial disproportionality. I know it's through the process, but it is particularly marked at this early stage. Mm. So that is my pray and aid uh, for you to listen and consider the challenges that I think arise. What of the empirical material that I want to speak to today? You have some pretty pictures uh, on your handout, uh, which derive from um, an empirical study that I conducted um, the field work being in late 2016 and throughout 2017. Uh, so that was a study that involved semi-structured interviews with children and young people, 41 of them, who have had recent experience as a child in police custody, um, with a range of different levels of experience and frequency of that experience. I also um, spent time uh, in police uh, custody suites in three different force areas, in six different suites, which were chosen for their variety, but I can tell you more about the methodology of the study if you want at the end. But it also involved interviews with nearly 100, or um, face-to-face -face discussions and interviews with nearly 100 police officers and staff, solicitors, appropriate adults, independent custody visitors um, in that setting. So a field work and interviews from children and young people. You'll notice there are names on the sheet, as you will imagine, those are pseudonyms um, and the age given is the age at interview, but their quotations there are those which derive from that study. But it is a little time ago now, and so I also draw in reflecting on this, on the slightly more recent work of Vicky Kemp and others, um, who conducted field work of a fairly similar sort in 20, 
2020, 2021, and uh, more recently even than that, accounts given by children and young people to the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Children in Police Custody. Um, and I can give you references uh, for that if you would like to read their compelling evidence earlier this year. So what of effective participation? What do the European Court uh, say uh, it should consist of? Well, I've included on the handout uh, the formulation of it in the case of Panovitz and Cyprus. You'll recognise uh, similarities from Thompson Venables um, and the case of SC. Uh, and so um, I, I, I shan't read it out because uh, you will um, you have it in front of you and the purpose of the time. Uh, but in short, the focus is on uh, reducing as far as possible the uh, feelings of intimidation and inhibition that the child may experience in that setting, ensuring the child has a broad understanding of the nature of the investigation, what's at stake, the significant of any pe significance of any penalty that might be imposed, but also ensuring that they appreciate their rights of defence, particularly their right of silence, and so that they can understand the general thrust of questioning by the police with such assistance as they may require. Um, and thinking in particular there about uh, the lawyer and in our jurisdiction, the appropriate adult. As you will anticipate, the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child in their general comments, particularly general comment 24, have elaborated on the child's rights under article 40 when they come into contact with the criminal justice process, uh, and they fleshed out, one might say, this right. In <laughs> particular, stressing the importance of continuous and systematic training for all the professionals who come into contact with children in that setting, ensuring that they understand about the child's development and their psychological and social needs. The importance of all practitioners supporting comprehension, uh, child-friendly language, adjustment so that there is an atmosphere of understanding, uh, physical adjustments in the form of child-friendly layouts of um, the relevant spaces, and in particular, the adaptation to accommodate children with disabilities. So a, a really broad spread uh, provided by the committee. And so my shorthand for you that I'm going to use today is this, and I've set it out in the boxes on the sheet. But there is a general duty in three different ways uh, to ensure adjustment, to minimise the child's situational adversities and to take account of their special need for protection. Secondly, to foster appreciation of their legal jeopardy, their options with regard to the allegation and their defence rights, particularly the right of silence. And then thirdly, the importance of enabling their understanding so that they have a general level of comprehension uh, so that they can participate directly in the questioning that they may face. So how is that? To what extent are those duties met, achievable uh, in police custody? So if I start with the first um, component, the ensuring of adjustment, and think in particular about minimising the child's situational adversity, Anybody here who's been into a police custody suite will know that they are very adult environments. There's no child custody suite as there might as there is a youth court. It is an adult environment, and there is no adaptation typically of the space. I'll come on to juvenile detention rooms in a moment uh, to accommodate the child. So it is an adult environment and one that is unpredictable and commonly unsettling for a child. Intimidation, uh, feelings of intimidation have a range of sources in that setting. And uh, one of the first uh, picture below um, uh, box number one uh, touches on contact with adults in that setting. There's no statutory duty to separate children in that setting. The statute uh, relates to charged adults. And so uh, children are not routinely separated from adults whilst they wait to be booked in. They may be standing alongside their officers and waiting alongside other adults. Commonly, the children that, and young people that I spoke to had little understanding of what was going to happen. Some more familiar, of course, but many not. 
and uh, they tended to fall back on US TV dramas for their understanding of what might occur. And so frightening looking adults next door were a source of some quite considerable distress to some children. You know, am I going to be locked up with this individual next to me? As you see Elijah it saying in the cartoon in the bottom left-hand corner. There is also a degree of intimidation, as you may well imagine, in the process itself. Uh, so the booking in process when the child is brought into the booking in seek, however kindly a custody officer may try to be, and many are, do make an effort to try to adjust their processes. But the routine processes that have to happen in that setting are unsettling and children uh, commented on uh, feeling harassed in that environment. So uh, all the children are patted down, <clears throat> as everyone is, all their personal belongings are taken from them, um, and then they experience the risk assessment. So a, a long series of really very intrusive personal questions in quite a public setting. It happens at pace, it is routinized often in the way officers approach it. As one officer explained to me, I pretty much do the same spiel with everyone just to make sure it's done. The focus is on ensuring that the process has happened. Um, the adjustment for the child is often minimal if present at all. Importantly, the child is unsupported at this point in the process. The lawyer, the appropriate adult is very, very rarely there at that point. Uh, and indeed will remain out of the picture for often six to eight hours. Um, those children who are strip searched, of course, have an even more extreme experience at this point. Uh, we've only recently had any statistical data from police custody from November last year, the first experimental statistics. They suggest that about 9% of children are strip searched of that group. 35% of the children from the 25 forces who provided the data identified themselves as being black or black British. So we're seeing very significant disproportionality at that point. Um, and as Tyler, who gave evidence to the all party parliamentary group um, described it, he said, I think strip searches are horrific. They make you feel disgusted, abused, belittled, and mainly violated. You'll be familiar with Child Q, and you may also have read the Children's Commissioner's report about strip search in the community and on stop and search. But as a precursor to a legal process, it's a very intimidating experience for a child. So um, adjustment to a counter inhibition and intimidation <laughs> is difficult to manage and is rarely achieved. What of the adjustment to take account of their inherent need for special care and protection? There is no shorter time limit for a child in police custody. Uh, they are subject to the 24 hour initial period that the adult is, despite their right not to be detained and for the shortest appropriate period, you know, unless absolutely necessary. Um, in my study, the average pre-charge period was 11 and a half hours for a child. That was replicated almost exactly in Vicky Kemp's more recent study. Detention periods have got longer over the last 50 years since um, the conflict case. And that translates into six to eight hours roughly in a cell before interview. Overnight, almost half of the children who are detained in police custody are detained overnight. That's a kind of four hour measure between 12 and four in the morning. Uh, again, they're disproportionately more likely to be black and ethnic minority uh, children. The adjustment of detention conditions is really minimal. There is such a thing as a juvenile detention room. As a, as a naive first person arriving in uh, police custody, I imagine that would be a very different space to an adult cell. In fact, it's internally identical. Sometimes there's a slightly different door. It might have no hatch, um, or it might have a partially glazed panel, but it is internal. It's internally identical, but actually commonly children are placed in adult cells. The um, prohibition in Code C in the secondary legislation is very permissive in that regard. What of support for those children who may have more substantial needs? Uh, well, uh, the College of Policing's guidance identifies a vast range of features in their lives and situations outside custody that might prompt the need for more additional support. And we'll all probably be familiar of in 
in this room with the prevalence of neurodiversity, uh, developmental difficulties in this cohort. The adjustment is very, very minimal. Uh, children struggle to manage their boredom and frustration and uncertainty. They're not allowed to keep a watch. They often don't know what the time is. They're doubtful about the um, hygiene around the food that they might be given. Um, their, the cell is unadjusted largely. Increasingly, there are boxes of destruction kits available for children and young people in that setting, but they're not routinely provided to them. The appropriate adult is the main adjustment. And uh, uh, Lord Justice Moses described it as the <laughs> gateway to the child's access to justice, uh, the key to uh, writing that imbalance, the uh, difference in power between the child and the adult officer. Um, but you may well be aware that although the role is really complex, it crosses the kind of justice welfare access the appropriate adult is there to reassure, advise, but not legally, and assist. But they're there also to support communication, check due process, ensure the child understands their rights and can exercise them. But this complex role is um, the first port of call for it is the parent or whoever the child resides with, whoever has parental responsibility. And children explained that actually, uh, surprisingly, how often they explained that they were pleased to have a parent there or someone that was familiar to them, both the older children and the younger children. But of course, for some, that was an added source of stress, especially if mum's English wasn't very good and they declined an interpreter or even if they had an interpreter. Um, parents themselves, as you'll see, I think I put it on the back page on the bottom left-hand corner, often described feeling thorough out of their depth, you know, feeling that they've let their child down by not knowing what they should do. And as you can appreciate, their understanding of what due process should look like and then their ability to um, effectively advocate for their child can be very limited. And officers were sometimes very suspicious of the motivations of parents. Conversely, if you couldn't have mum or someone known to you come down, then you get a volunteer appropriate adult. So a lay person trained for approximately 20 hours to attend um, and fulfil the role. Um, or it might be a social worker if you're in uh, the care of the local authority. And on the left in this uh, left-hand box, we see the difficulty that Zane describes that Whilst those individuals might be much better at the due process part of the role, they really struggled with the rapport part of the role. And many young people uh, found that they just couldn't uh, relate to the individual. So their ability to reassure was significantly reduced. But the key issue for um, the appropriate adult really is that they don't arrive until just before interviews. So all that wonderful stuff that they're meant to do, they can't do until they arrive. Um, sort of six to eight hours later. <clears throat> so there's a significant lack of adaptation of the process. What of the um, fostering of appreciation of their legal jeopardy? Um, we've traditionally seen very low uptake of legal advice. The child has to opt into the advice. Um, we were discussing earlier, there are now some um, pilots for mandatory legal advice um, occurring in different parts of the country. Uh, but children generally fail to understand the importance of legal advice or were sceptical about its independence or just felt it would take too long and delay their release. Even when they are represented, the solicitor arrives so late, six to eight hours later, that often children were just too exhausted to want to give full instructions or that's how they uh, related the position. Uh, to what extent do they appreciate their right to silence? You might be familiar with the concerns around the, co the caution and its intelligibility generally. Um, you will be unsurprised to hear that children generally struggle to appreciate uh, what the caution entailed, the adverse inference. Um, but interestingly, they were often unduly confident that they did understand it, which made it very difficult for solicitors. So in interview, 
uh, things are very difficult. I've run, I've run out of time fully. No, <laughs> already. I have another 10 minutes. Brilliant. Okay. Um, what about um, then the enabling of their understanding at interview stage? So there are kind of two issues here. The first is how effectively are we able to identify those who are unable to or unfit to be interviewed? And then secondly, how do we support those who are being interviewed to be interviewed in a way that they can engage with? The fitness for interview process is problematic to say the least. Firstly, the test itself is slightly confusingly set out between the body of the code and the annex so that there are two different tests that are set out. The point at which fitness for interview is assessed is very early in the process. It's generally assessed at the point of risk assessment when the child is brought in. It may be eight, 10 hours before they are interviewed. Obviously, later in the day arrives the solicitor and the appropriate adults who also have a role in terms of assessing whether that individual can fairly be interviewed. But at that point, the child is generally, as they reported, unwilling to raise any issues for fear that that will delay their release. And frankly, solicitors explain that actually once they get there, the emphasis is on getting into interview and getting out. Um, so picking up um, unfitness is a, a difficult matter. It's asked in the risk assessment process, which generally focuses on physical health in the cell. If a child does have a significant uh, participatory ability, there isn't really recourse to an intermediary in police custody. There's no framework for making that happen, in contrast to the position in Northern Ireland. Uh, mm. So very little support if you are on that borderline. You might have mum as your appropriate adult. Her ability to support your communication in that sort of setting may be significantly compromised. Mm -hmm. But what about those who are not at that borderline? How is the interview process itself adjusted? Well, the answer again is that it is not all very minimally adjusted. Those working in the courts will be familiar with ABE, achieving best evidence, and uh, the framework around uh, who and how um, a, a child or a vulnerable witness for the prosecution should be interviewed. There is no such framework for police interview. Um, you could be interviewed by someone with the very lowest level of interview training. Mm. Uh, so there's no special requirement. Um, and children reported coercive interviewing experience. They commonly reported that they felt they'd been tripped up, uh, that their words had been twisted by what we would call leading or legal closure questions, that they'd been misled about what co-arrestees had said, those sorts of concerns. Uh, so there are real um, concerns about the reliability of the evidence, I would suggest, that is produced in this context and also whether any evidence is produced at all. So after all that stress um, of being in custody, a significant proportion of the young people I spoke to said, do you know what, I just say no comment now mm -hmm. because I can't go through that again. And indeed solicitors said, look, if there's any issue around their uh, ability, fitness for interview, I just advise no comment. Uh, and Vicky Kent's more recent study has identified, again, a significant proportion of no comment interviews. So we're going through this process for very little gain in many cases. So reliability of evidence is a serious concern, I would suggest. But not only that, but the impact thereafter of the process, the exclusionary experience of this process is really significant. Children reported to me, and they reported also to Vicky Kemp in her study, that this is a punitive extreme, the part of the punishment. Uh, they think that they are being summarily punished in this setting. And as all, you know, all of us who have teenage children will know, they have a very strong sense of how unfair that is. It's not mm. fair, I've not been convicted. And they recognize that it really turns the youth justice system on its head. This is the most extreme and harsh experience they have at the hands of the youth justice process. Because once you get into the youth justice process post-charge, it takes a very long time to get to custody. Uh, but they get that experience um, early in police custody. So why does this persist? Uh, there are several reasons. There are practical barriers. Of course, there are 
But the environment, frankly, is inherently unsuitable for fostering effective participation. There are substantial resourcing constraints, not least the lack of sufficient legal aid to support uh, solicitors providing a, a, a broader time scale of advice. And there are cultural challenges. There are, whilst there are many custody officers and staff who are sympathetic to the difficulties children experience in police custody, there is a core in every team that I encountered, at least, who take the view that police custody performs a purpose in terms of deterring. It's a form of naughty step for uh, children that they encounter on the street. And they consider that adjusting processes to make things more accessible to children undermines the fundamental power of the custody process. What they don't understand is that what children say about that punitive experience is that it reduces the police's legitimacy in their eyes. They don't feel they should go to them for help. They don't feel they're on their side. And all the problematic corollary that follows from that reduction in trust. So... Where do we go from here? How do we change uh, this uh, landscape? And uh, there are two things that I think are really key here. Uh, first is the shortcomings in the legal framework. The child is almost absent from case. If you actually read the primary legislation, they barely feature. Mm -hmm. There are only two protections for a child. Um, in police custody in the statutory legislation and uh, associated legislation like the um, Children and Young Persons Act. Um, we need primary legislation to drive a change in attitude in the police custody suite and in particular, for example, a reduction in that clock, the 24-hour clock, a halving of the 24-hour clock would make a huge difference to children in police custody. Mm. We need a mandatory legal advice so that you can opt out only on advice. And that's starting to happen. Uh, we need a proper review of the appropriate adult safeguard. We've known for decades. We knew at the time of CONFE and the Royal Commission on Criminal Procedure that the appropriate adult role asked too much and was too demanding. Successive inquiries have noted that, but we've made no change to the vision. So we need some very substantive primary legislation. I hate to say that because we know how difficult it is. But there's a question for the assembled company, I think, here. Um, because really we cut the custody process adrift from the rest of the youth justice process. The police effectively follow their own noses. And we don't have, from a court's perspective, very much input into overseeing and making accountable uh, those who uh, come into contact with children in that setting. As I've said, children rarely uh, make it to trial. Um, and we know that section 76, section 78 of PACE arguments have a very high threshold. The courts have very little scrutiny, very little opportunity to scrutinize and where they have done the approach that we've seen has been rather inconsistent, for example, in relation to appropriate adults. So if we are to think more holistically about fair trial protections for children in that custody phase that's become more of the adjudicatory phase, what should the role of the courts be in that? How can the courts play a role in ensuring that the protections are in place. At trial, the judge is there to ensure, to hold the peace between the parties. There is no such judicial, quasi-judicial role. The custody sergeant is meant to be independent, but for other reasons I can explain. If you're interested, that doesn't function very well. So that's my question to you all. I've overrun my time. But do you see a role for the courts in bringing this process back into the youth justice system? And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Great, Phil. Um, I'm responding to this um, paper as a um, practitioner. And I, I think that um, my starting point would be what a cracking 
paper. And, and, and what really, I think it's, it's a really needful um, examination of the topic, really insightful and um, really helpful. Um, my stance uh, would really, my starting point would really be that my view as, uh, as a pr practitioner and somebody who's been in and out of police stations for 20 years is that the current provision is effectively not fit for purpose. Uh, that would be my starting point. And I think that some of the suggestions that were alluded to in that paper with regard to um, fewer detentions, uh, a, a greater use of street bail, a greater use of voluntary interviews, uh, reduced custody times, are all really interesting, really available, and really cost-effective measures that would um, genuinely make a difference to both children's experience in custody and also the, the effective use of that custody. So in considering the paper, the things that I was thinking about is what makes it so difficult to work with um, children in custody? Um, the starting point is the kind of children that we meet in custody and that we that we work with. They're most often, the majority of them, um, from poor social uh, and economic backgrounds. They have it hard at home. They have it hard at school if they are in school. And they live on hard estates. Um, they often, at the police station, have um, either diagnosed or undiagnosed um, cognitive and behavioural um, difficulties. They often have um, a history of trauma and they're always in crisis when they're at the police station. Mm. Um, they feel isolated while they're there. And also while they're there, they feel very often overwhelmed by anxiety at what waits, awaits them when they leave the police station. They're worried about snitching. They're worried about being perceived as snitches. They're worried about disappointing their parents. They're worried about their parents being angry. And also they're worried about the stuff that they were meant to be doing, but they can't do now because they're at the police station. Mm -hmm. um, black and ethnic minority children are overrepresented. And why that matters is because the children and their families have a distrust of the system and um, do perceive it as being systemically racist. And so, of course, that's going to affect um, the ability and the willingness uh, uh, to participate. Um, children that are struggling at the police station um, will typically manage their confusion and their fear um, by masking it and by shutting down, not by opening um, up. And how they were very often um, present um, because they're shutting down and because they're trying to mask this kind of huge anxiety, as I say, um, that they're feeling, is they will often present as sullen, insolent, or indifferent, uh, you, you know, as though they don't care. Um, the next thing that I think that we need to think about when considering effective participation in the police station is how these children get there. So um, in many cases, the um, stop detention and then arrest of a child goes smoothly, but just as often it doesn't. So if a police officer takes a decision that they want to stop and question the child, if that child doesn't stop or young person doesn't stop, if they walk away or if they run away, what kicks in then is the police's use of reasonable force. And what reasonable force looks like in those circumstances is children and young people being taken to the ground, face down on a, a um, pavement. And what is available to the officers um, is reasonable force in the, in the form of knee strikes, um, distraction punches, uh, the use of what they describe as tactical language or, or verbal stunning. And what is meant by that, and I don't mean to... Um, I just don't want to sanitize the experience. So what is meant by that is officers slamming kids into the pavement and saying, you know, um, get fucking down mm, now, get your swearing. fucking hands out now, because they want to cuff them. So these are full on adults swearing and cussing and punching kids. And that is deemed reasonable force. And that is not challengeable. That will happen to these children um, before they arrive at the police station. Um, in addition to that, officers have available to them spit hoods and leg restraints. Those are less commonly used, but what is always used is handcuffs. Mm -hmm. So handcuffs always go on the kids. 
And what invariably happens when handcuffs go on kids and adults is injuries. It comes with injuries and, and the children and young people will complain of the abrasions and the bruisings um, that they suffer. Um, Body-worn cameras are there to, um, uh, to, to, to keep a record uh, of what has happened. Um, but in, in my experience, and as I say, 20 years of it, um, body-worn cameras can be switched on and off. And also the body-worn footage that is served on defence lawyers is very often served in the form of edited clips. And to actually get the full footage from a stop takes a lot of effort. And also subsequent to getting the full footage, what will not frequently happen, I'm not suggesting that, but what will regularly happen is cases will be dropped after the full footage of how this child was actually stopped and detained is eventually um, obtained. So then the child gets to the police station um, and in the holding cell, and then as has been alluded to, um, they're booked in. Um, I agree with the fact that a custody suite is an adult environment. It's chaotic, it's risky, and what it requires is to be managed firmly and um, managed decisively. And that doesn't really lend itself very well to sort of a nuanced respond to a child. Yeah. Um, also, I would concur that a significant number of um, officers really and quite overtly resent concessions being made to children and young people in mm. custody. Mm -hmm. um, they look at them and what their assessment of them is that they're bang at it, that they're schooled in criminality and that what is needed for them is a short, sharp lesson and not some sort of woke indulgence. So there is a, a hardcore uh, of police officers um, that, that do hold that view. Um, when they're at the custody counter, they will be flanked by the officers that um, arrested them. So when they're asked vis-a-vis uh, -vis the risk assessment, anything going on with you that we should know about, they're expected to disclose that in the company of the, those very officers who who just just before now took them to the ground and and perhaps behaved in the way that I've um, said. So it is a difficult um, uh, occasion at which for them to admit any further kind of vulnerability. I've seen an increase. Um, uh, a, a, an uptick in strip searches at police stations. If when the young person is at the custody desk and being booked in, they fail what is known as the attitude, colloquially as the attitude test, um, one sure way of getting a young person to behave themselves at a police uh, station is to strip search them. And it's such mm. a humiliating experience that what you will see when you read the custody record afterwards is that the feisty behaviour that was going on before sure enough isn't subsisting after a strip search. And the authority to impose a strip search on a young person is very elastic. So it's pretty easy to justify a strip search of a child. Um, the problem with appropriate adults, in my view, is that they don't have a duty of confidentiality. So in terms of um, uh, uh, promoting engagement, it, it's limited by the fact that they don't have a duty of um, confidentiality. Um, appropriate adults that are, are from the family are quite often either angry, disappointed, or out of their depth mm. uh, with regard to the child, um, how, however much they kind of care about what's going on. And with regard to the scheme adults, too many of them, no, that's overstating it, some of them um, just seem overly familiar with the police and too comfortable with them, which kind of undermines uh, their um, credibility. Um, with regard to the attendance of the uh, defence lawyers, and of course I'm a defence lawyer, um, at the police station, I think it's quite rightly been addressed that they tend not to get there. We tend not to get there till just before the interview. One of the reasons for that, and it may seem kind of pretty um, prosaic, but it's a pretty practical reason, is that on a Saturday night, if you're a defence lawyer and you get called to a police station, you get a flat fee. And that flat fee is 110, uh, 110 pound. 
So if you get a child that's, say, arrested at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and they're not interviewed until 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, if you as the defence lawyer arrive at 10 o'clock and provide the kind of service you know, that may, you know, may be desirable or kind of whatever, whatever, the fact is that a defence lawyer is being paid less if your washing machine gets into trouble on a Saturday. Mm. The person that comes out and fixes your washing machine will be paid more than if your child or your brother or your uncle got into trouble because of the way that legal aid is um, uh, set out. And that's just, it may seem a bit crass, it may seem a bit mercenary, but you've got to fund it properly um, for it to work. Um, moving on kind of quite swiftly, talking about pre-interview disclosure, effective participation, where it really kicks in and where it really counts is of course in the interview. That's when you want a young person to be able to um, participate effectively. If the young person is unrepresented, then they won't be given, or, or, nor would their adult, what is described as pre-interview disclosure. So the short summary of this is the allegation and this is why we say you're involved, which is provided by the police, will be provided to a lawyer. But if you opt out of legal representation, it won't be provided to you. So you go into the interview effectively cold in terms of um, knowing, well, what's the allegation about and uh, what's the evidence against me? You would have been told some of that when you were booked in, but not, as I say, um, several hours later. That may well have um, gone out of your head. Um, when the lawyers do meet with the um, clients, um, I agree that it's several hours um, later. Um, and I agree that by then, um, the child that you're meeting is anxious, is exhausted, is frustrated. Very often they won't have eaten, they won't have slept properly. Um, they complain of feeling cold and feeling unwell. They're difficult to work with because they're in a poor state, having kind of been in a police station for hours. And then you've got to try and explain to them quite difficult legal concepts like joint enterprise, adverse inference, the caution. It's all under pressure of time. It's often in a locked room. You're often locked in with this young person. And it's always with a police officer waiting outside. When do you think you're going to be ready for this interview? Um, and then finally, or pretty close to finally, um, talking about the interview itself um, and in terms of effective participation, it's a really, really, really rare thing for me, and I thought about it quite hard in advance of attending today, um, to advise, advise a child to go full comment in an interview, mm. so to answer all the questions that are put to them. So immediately, obviously, that's a constraint on effective participation because you're saying, well, you don't go full comment. But the reason for that is simple, is this is a child talking to a professional adult. It's not a level... Um, playing field. So in terms of effective participation, it's immediately um, limited in that way. But also, I wouldn't generally advise a young person to um, go for comment with an officer, because although they're supposed to be an investigating officer, investigating this, more often what they're doing is building a case against the mm. child. Um, and how that's easily evidenced and easily exemplified is if you took a really straightforward situation like a fight outside school, the child's arrested because they've been involved in the fight, the police officer who's doing the interview will refer to um, the other person as the victim. They will say to the young person, um, we've got a statement from the victim, the victim is saying this. Well, although that might kind of sound pedantic or small, if that person's a victim, then I must be the perpetrator. So it's crystal clear from the get-go where the interviewing officer's head is. They've got a statement from the victim and they're interviewing you as the perpetrator. Um, and then, so finally, um, I could say more is the truth because mm -hmm. it's just such a great topic and such an interesting topic. Um, but with regard to if after the interview, um, your client is um, kept, is charged, 
and is going to be kept overnight to be produced at court. The default position is supposed to be that um, a local authority bed is provided, either secure or non-secure. In 20 years, I've never known that happen. Mm. I have never gone to court and had to say to the sales or to the court staff, do you know where my client is coming to, from today? Um, because they've been kept overnight. I know where they're coming from. They're always coming from the custody suite. Um, so in summary, and as I say, because I've been asked to respond to this paper, I wouldn't say that what we've got at the moment is a shambles. I'm not kind of going as far as that. And I do think that most of the time, most of the professionals that I meet are reasonably competent and are usually um, well-intentioned, but notwithstanding that, because you're trying to deal with children um, in an adult environment and for all the reasons that have been set out, my baseline view is that it's currently not fit for purpose and that actually the measures that have been referred to in the paper um, uh, represent interesting and achievable changes that would be likely to um, uh, result in significantly more effective participation. I don't think after both of these two speaking, there's a lot, a lot left for me to say in many ways. I mean, there is, there's a, a, so much to say that it's quite difficult to bring it all down. Um, I will start by saying again, like Kath, uh, I think this is a, a really, really good, and when I say interesting paper, I don't just mean sort of esoterically or academically. I think it's absolutely about what needs to change. And actually, when you really look at it, it's quite shocking that with all the changes that have been made in the system, within the youth justice system to the court system, that somehow this has all been overlooked by everybody. Um, we're all familiar, I would have thought, certainly we will be, um, with the years and years and years of different analysis, reports, assessments, reviews that have been done into the youth justice system and the criminal justice system overall, particularly around race and other issues, mental health, but none of them, and although most of them have identified in practical terms and in outcome terms, a lot of the issues that you've raised, very few of them, I'm trying to think of, of any, have actually identified this key issue about how the whole custody process and I would actually say that that starts at the point of rest so it's custody and detention and I think Kath and I spoke a bit about our views last night and I think we generally agree on from a practitioner's point of view it's it's right at the point of arrest it might actually even be before arrest it's with interaction with the police but this whole area has not been looked at, and I think it has to be. And so to really focus down, because there's no point in me wasting people's time repeating my views that are the same, I think we need to look at where can we go with this? I think we, we all agree that this needs to change. I think the recommendations that you have set out at the end, and I'll, I'll just read them because, in fact, I think by the time you got to the end of it, but Miranda concluded by saying that this research unearths a more fundamental challenge about how to address the changing shape of the adversarial process that does now take place in the, in the police station, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. How can equality of arms, other fair trial procedures and guarantees be secured at the police station? Is there a case for wider judicial engagement with the police investigation and diversion? And how can the wider youth justice system that we do agree has had some changes to it, they're not perfect, be incorporated into the police station stage. 
And is there a place, and I think this is key, for moving away from the adversarial process for the lower end of child offending? you know, the less serious cases. And wh when you really look at it, it is unbelievable, actually. Um, and I think when you're in it, you sort of know it. You know this is happening all the time. You're well aware that these none of these things are in place. But until somebody actually stops and says, oh, and and you're sort of from the outside of it as well, in a way, because, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, obviously you were a barrister before, but you're looking at it in a sort of academic -y way, as not as a practitioner at this moment, but you've really pinpointed where where do we go and what we need to do. I would, so I salute you for that, but I also think that, and it's good in a way that it's in this context, because this is a context of both students, practitioners, maybe even some people with power, I don't know, maybe not, but if not, then those are the ones we have to go out to and talk to. Um, I would just add a few other key points, but I think they're there for discussion. So I think this has arisen primarily in, the ter in terms of the context of racism, but many of you will have heard of the term adultification by now. Some of you will. And it is primarily, it has arisen within discussion of the experiences of young black men, particularly, although now also young black women after child Q and other, some of the more overt instances of what has happened. But actually, you can extend that right out of, right out of that context it is very specific to young black men but it's actually what's going on here these young people are not being treated as children and young people they're effectively many of them being looked at by the individual officers sometimes the lawyers quite frequently the appropriate adults quite often people involved in mental health and all the diversion schemes as almost adult and I think that's particularly problematic at the end the sort of high point 17 and 18 year olds there's obviously a lot of other discussion about well when are you actually an adult and there's there's a lot of thought about whether in fact 18 is an artificial cutoff point um, whether it should be 21 and what's the positioning of young adults who are 21 to 25 you know this is why this is so huge but, but this is what is overarching the whole thing. I was involved in um, a working party with Justice and we brought out a report in 2021. It was quite difficult because it was sort of in the middle of COVID, tackling racial injustice within the criminal, the youth justice system. And we are, and I would urge, and it's not because I was involved, but I, I was rereading some of it at great speed this morning to try and prepare for this. And actually, it's a really, really interesting report. And I'll send you a link. And it does focus primarily on young black people, but it does look at other groups of young people, Muslim, Gypsy, Roma, other discriminated against groups. And everything that you have discussed is 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 there um and i think I, personally i've been involved in community work legal work youth related work for nearly 40 years and i'm tired of reports i really uh, that's again no disrespect to you but i really do want to look at practical solutions and i do think that really feasible changes to the hours, to looking at whether in fact young people should only be detained if it is for indictable only, you know, the most serious offences. Then more work has to be done on the blurred lines between perpetrator and victim, particularly in crimes associated with so-called county lines and all sorts of other stuff you know the majority of which you know the kids we work with that perpetrator victim 
blur is very, very present. Also, voluntary interviews, Caution Plus Three voluntary interviews, because that has an impact not only just on not detaining the kids there and then, but the control that they can feel over that investigatory process when it's a day in time that they can make. It's not disturbing school or other things they're doing. They have a proper appropriate adult who is the right person that they feel good with. They have the lawyer they want and are not having to have a duty solicitor. And the, and just the feeling of control over that process immediately engenders a more positive, positive is the wrong word, uh, a stronger feeling of, of control, I suppose it is. Also, there are other knock-on effects with that. Um, if you don't have a child arrested, but it's a voluntary interview, so you don't have a custody record, and you don't have all of the digital um all of the digital stuff that happens with photographs the biometrics because they're not under arrest then that also has an impact on the kids and it also has an impact going forward with records um in terms of if children are nfa'd the whole question of childhood interactions with the police and subsequent impact on your future life i mean you know the subject is huge, so I'm going to stop here um, because there are so many different things and it would be great to see what the audience are interested in and what kind of other questions people have because it might raise other topics. Well, thank you very much, Kath and Jude. Uh, much appreciate A round of applause, please. So... Um, the floor is now open for questions. Um, if any of you have a question, please raise your hand now. There's a, Matt, there's a question there. Hi. Oh, don't, don't worry about that. All right. <laughs> it's, it's for the online oh, audience. Sorry. Um, thank you so much. All the speakers, brilliant. And my question's about county lines exploitation. Mm. So in terms of, do you think it's worth, Miranda in particular, expanding defences, tailor-making them, for children and young people. So like section 45 for modern slavery victims, you don't need compulsion. Is it worth expanding that to other types of defenses? And the second thing, is it worth having something where a child will never face trial with an adult? Because that's the problem we have with county lines. Mm. They don't disclose things at interview. We can't sort it out at police interview stage because they're scared. Because the person who's also going to be charged is the adult exploiting them often. I think the issue about uh, joint charge with adult is really substantial and it affects everything, doesn't it? And like, delay, um, yeah. it affects uh, what happens in the Crown Court and the adjustments that are made there in terms of kind of what's happening. If you think about the recent case of ZA has really brought a bit of attention on the lack of adjustment and lack of thought that goes into uh, adjusting for children in the Crown Court. Um, I will leave others perhaps to talk about the expansion of the defences. I want to make a slightly different point, which lead, which kind of goes back to Jude's point about that adversarial setting, because before we're thinking about the scope of the available defences, I think what's really significant about the fact that children are, face an adversarial process is that at that point of arrest, um, I'm afraid that the police really struggle to see anything other than perpetrator, don't they? And the child comes in, as soon as you come in in handcuffs, you are very much the perp and uh, the child is the victim. Uh, the, you know, the victim is identified. I think your point about the language of interview is really key. That's absolutely right, that it crystallizes at that point. And I think often the chance is lost, even to begin to think about what those defenses might be because of that adversarial nature at that point. And the children take an oppositional approach as well. They're very conscious. You are against me now because you've put me to the floor, you've handcuffed me. I can't raise anything because you and I are in a battle here. And I think there's a fundamental problem at that gateway point. I'm probably not expert to talk about the expansion of the defences, but you might have um, had difficulties with that. Well, hi, nice to see you. 
I was going to actually just carry on from your point, um, which kind of does relate to what you're saying, but I think that we have to look way back because it was something I forgot to say, but I think the diversion issue is absolutely key. And actually, um, before we even get to putting energy into thinking about changing the law in terms of defences, we have to look at what happens in the police station with diversion. Certainly one of the findings that we had from the justice um, working group, which I think everybody knows, is that it is massively disproportionate in terms of its use, use against black and brown people or children. And it is massively um, unequal across the country in the way that it works and police officers don't really understand it those that try to suggest it as something for people that are not practitioners it means diverting the young person from charge from court in its broadest sense so i i, I mean you have identified that here as well but i think that is a very very big area that actually again practically we could really do some real work in changing what happens to those kids um, before they even get anywhere near a charge and a defence and a trial and all the rest of it. It's huge. Yeah, there's some there's some work going on to consider and think about addressing that disproportionality at that stage. But one of the key challenges is that the police are often making that decision without expert youth specialists input. Yes, sometimes children are referred for consideration by the Youth Justice Service for a caution, but sometimes that decision sits and remains with the police. Mm. And that's just another of those moments at which they need the Youth Justice Specialists in that arena yeah. if we're going to Absolutely. crack some of those challenges around the kind of unduly yeah. low uptake of caution for um, yeah. you know, black and minority ethnic young people. It, it, the numbers are really striking, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And actually also, I mean, just to make sense to people who don't quite get what we're on about, I don't mean people here, but actually you're right. You know, if you if you look at what happens in the youth court, in most cases, nobody would dream of somebody being sentenced without the youth offending team doing a pre-sentence report. So you have the input there and that is, yes, it's post-trial or post-plea. Why would you not be doing that in the police station when you're thinking about what you're doing right at the very beginning? Are you charging? Are you diverting? What's the proper um, input from which agencies? So it, it just actually is very stark. The yacht are involved to a degree, but some of the problem is that the police who deal with all of this do not understand how the yacht works. They don't understand what their considerations. You remember the example I gave you last night? I remembered it really clearly of a young man who was 15, who was arrested for a knife point robbery, no previous convictions. The police officer was actually very sweet and he wanted to do the best for this child. And so Without knowing anything at all about the yacht processes, he said, I'm going to send it to the yacht because I want him to have what's called a triage. It's the lowest level for a child. And I said to him, well, you do understand that the yacht policy for knife point robberies is that they are extremely unlikely to do that. Have you spoken to the police officer who's embedded in the yacht? Have you spoken to the lead yacht person who will be looking at my client's case? What arguments could you put forward as the lead officer to push them to go beyond their policy? And he did not know what I was talking about. And part of the challenge is that the pace clock is ticking. And if we could take those children out of, I mean, the knife point robbery is probably a slightly unusual situation. But for those lesser offences, can we take the child out of the custody process? so that those sorts of discussions and engagements can happen in slow time and not in sort of pace yeah, time. Yeah. That's where the decision making yeah. is so challenged and the access to that information yeah. is hard to achieve. Sorry, we, Sorry, we, we, to we totally went off point. <laughs> 
who please be encouraged to introduce yourself to people who are with us. Uh, hi, my name is Shad. Um, I'm a researcher. Um, I wanted to actually ask a question about the topic that Jude uh, brought up about the um, age cutoffs and how difficult it is to find one that sort of makes sense and isn't completely arbitrary. I've seen elsewhere people bring up that maybe what we're trying to target here isn't actually age, but rather is level of maturity. Because if you have a 17 and 18 year old treated very differently, they might actually have the same level of maturity. But then you run into all of the issues also that you mentioned with sort of um, these assessments of maturity and how there can be a lot of inherent bias in those. And you don't either want to end up sort of punishing a child for having taken on a more adult role completely against their own will, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so sort of to, I, I wanted to know what your opinions are on that, if there's a way to challenge that maturity or age cutoff definitions problem. And if there's not, I'm wondering if maybe a lot of the problems that we're tackling here with um, children in these positions are actually laying bare bigger issues um, that, you know, we see with children's particular vulnerabilities, but actually are pretty serious for adults too, with having an adversarial system, having also a system that's set up where the police at the same time have this role of, you know, security and preventing crime and catching criminals, but then are given this very legal role of interviewing and fact finding and starting this whole criminal justice process. Mm -hmm. So sort of in answer to your question at the beginning as well, I wanted to ask whether the role here should be for the for the courts or rather for sort of some redesign and how we parcel out different police responsibilities. Mm -hmm. I know that's a lot of questions in one. <laughs> um, I, I'll take part of that if I may. I, I mean, I think with regard to chronological age, I think that um, that's kind of much less important important in some ways at the police station because I think there's so many other factors at play in in terms of cognitive difficulties and behavioral difficulties and the stress of the situation and um, that it really really affects um, the young person's um, function so uh, I, I would certainly um, address it in that way but one of the things that I wouldn't want to downplay having said all of that is that um, with the children and the young people that we're working with, there is um, some real. Sorry, oh, oh, so sorry. sorry. Oh, so sorry. No, sorry. Oh. Um, that with the children and the young people that we're working with, that there is real jeopardy at play, and there are real crimes being committed. The level of violence um, amongst um, the young people that we work with is just breathtaking. I mean, it, it's just kind of astonishing. I mean, most of the young people that I work with who um, uh, kind of work with on a regular basis, the kind of injuries that they've um, sustained, the kind of injuries that they've inflicted as well, but, I mean, mm. uh, uh, it, it's kind of really, really um, serious stuff. I mean, I know that I was talking to, um, one young person and um, I, I was asking them about whether they had any disabilities and whether that might impact on the way that they were able to engage and I remember he's 14 years old and he said to me well I'm blind in one eye and I sort of said well um, is, is that congenital and he looked a bit confused and I said but was it at birth and he said no I was stabbed in the eye it was a street thing and I mean it, it's just that so Although we've been talking about children, there's kind of quite a, dif a difference between um, the, the, a, a huge number of them where it really is just kid stuff. And to a significant degree, it's stuff that, in my view, should just never be criminalised in any event, you know, kind of fights after school, criminal damage. Some shoplifting. Mm. It just shouldn't be mm. criminalised. There should be much more use there of kind of community resolution, community mm. type disposals. They just shouldn't be being arrested. But then there is a minority um, where um, th that um, although they are chronologically children, the level of criminality that they've been drawn into is it, it, just so... Um, scary and so shocking um, so for example if you had a, a child at the police station you know 14 15 or whatever who's been found with class a in their pocket and maybe a drugs phone um, and this kind of almost relates back to the um, 
uh, trafficking, the county lines uh, kind of question, is you might, as a defence lawyer, for example, be able to bat that one away. Um, but outside of the police station, the person who provided those drugs and the person who in particular provided that phone will be waiting for that young person and will put them back to work. And one of the things that, one of the reasons why I got so kind of passionate when I was talking about it is because when children are disaffected from police officers, it's a missed opportunity because it's about reduction of risk and it's about um, uh, promoting safety. So in, in it, the chronological age of a child is kind of just one starting point. Mm. And the way that they function is, is kind of affected, obviously, um, by the situation that they're in and also um, by other operating factors in terms of anxiety about what's going out and about elsewhere. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. And I think it <laughs> is really, really important to for those children who are facing extremely serious allegations that we get this process right. Absolutely. It must be secure. Just what I was going to say. Yeah. That they absolutely have to be provided with that mm -hmm. support. So there needs to be a solicitor available for a significant proportion of their time in that setting. Um, and that's why it's so important to get the, the lesser offences out of the custody suite. You don't need them there. It's damaging for them to be there. There will be that core who are on very serious offences, but they need the proper protection. Um, and they need, they really need to be able to participate effectively. And your point about snitching and mm -hmm. what's happening outside, the majority significant proportion of the children that I spoke to, those that had repeated experiences, they are not, they're like, uh, the guy said something about rights, but do you know what I was worried about? You know, I've now lost that bag of stuff. Absolutely. They've taken the cat yeah. off me. What can I say? Yeah. Can I say anything? What's going to happen when I get out of it? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to be able to go home? Will mum, you know, will mum have me back? Those sorts of issues. They're thinking about such substantial issues that the question of, you know, do I understand joint enterprise, which is really important. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's very low down. Absolutely. So I think your point yeah. is well made about the difficulties of chron chronological age stops. And, you know, there's such a consensus now about the developing brain and kind of yeah. the need to think about young adults right up until 25, I think, yeah. and to understand the impact of that development on their decision making capacity, yeah. both in criminal proceedings and at the time of the offence. Mm. But there is there is really strong argument for adjusting processes. 18 plus um and of course though there's never a political will for it the more we do research like this the more we see that the kind of 10 to 14 year old age bracket is really problematic and there's repeatedly and always evidence mm. that suggests that obviously our minimum age of criminal responsibility is arguably too low um but yeah i think yeah. the young adults come into this category and indeed everybody in custody is situationally vulnerable in lots of the ways that we're talking about here. It, it's a difficult process for yeah, anyone. Yeah, it? I mean, I completely agree, <clears throat> excuse me, and there is also evidence, although I don't think nearly as much, but there has been research done about the impact on the brain of, I'll put it as lack of love, but actually what is, I mean, it is to do with not being within an impactful, caring environment. There's been a lot of different research. Kids' company, before they were disbanded, were doing that. Um, and that also then has actual physiological impacts on the brain and how it functions and decision-making and all the rest of it. So that, but I, I, going back to your point as well about both of you, about the really, really serious offences, we have to, you know, the, the police have to understand that these are still kids. They are still 18 and under. In fact, they're 17, because the minute you're 17 and 99 days, or whatever it is, 363 and a half four, or four days, you're 18 and then you're an adult. So whatever the offence is, 
they have, you know, we do, I agree with you that this is actually very much not more for those kids because the ones on the less serious offences are also very vulnerable, but it, it is for those two different cohorts. And if we can get it right and move out the treatment into a different way and a different structure for those younger ones, the less serious offences, then we can focus more on those still understanding that they're 18, under 18 year olds, still understanding adultification, still understanding the victim perpetrator dynamic that goes on everywhere. Uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, wow. and that's not gonna happen, I think. But, uh, let's start here and let's let's get let's get two questions. If you have more time you take you take it now. Um, well. Hi, my name's Ria and I just wanted to ask um what's it like how do you guys suggest like maybe police officers and people within the pl like police stations conduct themselves so we can avoid situations like kids getting like pushed down to the floor and and getting stripped down? And then we'll try to get you okay. <laughs> Thanks for speaking. Uh, I come from Korea, so I don't know the English justice system so well. Mm. But I have a question about the case you cited, please. Panovich, uh, Cyprus, yes. This decision uh, mentions the right of an accused minor and also the due regard to his vulnerability. So uh, it says about the necessary assistance of interpreter, lawyer, and social workers, but but it seems it doesn't seem to mention the intermediary system, intermediary system. So I don't know the reason. Uh, maybe I, I I think the intermediary system is only for the Defendant. So uh, I want to know the defendant intermediary system is not yet introduced in English. So the intermediary system, yeah. um, it does exist in the court, court system. And in fact, the government have changed the provisions. So um, a, a defendant, well, they don't really have a, there is a statutory right, it's not in force. Uh, but there are now better arrangements uh, to provide an intermediary for defendants and the court uses its inherent jurisdiction, so its inherent powers to uh, grant an intermediary where that is required, although very sparingly exercised and rarely for the whole of evidence. So the defendant can have, in court, can have an intermediary, uh, but it's less regularly granted than it would be for a prosecution witness, let's say and often just for the defendant's evidence. But in the um, custody block, so for police interview, anecdotally, I've spoken to intermediaries who have supported suspects in interview. That's tended to be in cases where they weren't custodially arrested. So they were attending, um, having been bailed to attend for interview rather than within a period of detention. Oh, God, yeah. Um, so the scheme that we have in place for defendant intermediary provision um, doesn't have a, a limb that works in the police custody uh, suite. But one could work out some way of reimbursing, and it has happened, but there's no arrangement for it. Interestingly, in Northern Ireland, albeit a much smaller jurisdiction, the Northern Ireland intermediary scheme does have intermediaries for mm -hmm. custody suites. So if you're interested, John Taggart has written quite a lot about mm -hmm. the different intermediary provisions. But That's there will inevitably, you know, if there are defendants at trial who need intermediaries, well, they probably also needed an intermediary in the police station. At the moment, the appropriate adult is the only the only response to custody officer concerns that uh, they may have participatory difficulties. But appropriate adults are not trained 
communication specialists and the way that intermediaries are. Um, so there's a real gap in that provision there. Um, to answer the question about how should police officers avoid these sorts of confrontations, well, I think generally there's a huge need for training <laughs> in relation to police officers understanding and knowing how to engage with children. So, for example, police officers don't typically, or at least the forces that I've engaged with, with have any uh, child specialist restraint training. You know, there is such a thing because it's um, that sort of training is provided to YOI officers and officers in the secure state. It's not typically provided to um, officers on the street, at least those that I've engaged with. And, and, and the child restraint techniques are different. The handcuffs are one size fits all, for example. And so children often, officers often complain that children can slip out of cuffs. So officers always tighten them extra tight on kids because they know they can slip out of them. So not only are they heavy in an adult proportioned way, but they're also generally tighter mm. than children because they know of those dangers. So there's a lack of training and there's a lack of provision for, for them. Um, and there's a lack of understanding um, about some of these issues, how children approach those unduly pun punitive um, approaches and also why a child might run away. So yes, lots of the children that I spoke to talked about, well, firstly, some children run away for fun or they, they talk about, we bait the local officers and then we run off. But much more commonly, children are like, I'm really scared. My friends tell me what happens if you get arrested. So when the police came to me, I ran away. And then, of course, children run really fast, often mm. faster than a middle-aged officer. Yeah. So then more officers get involved. Yeah. Um, so everything sort of spirals Escalates. towards the harshest available mechanism um, because of their kind of inherent naturally immature response to um, the police but also i would I, I would add that some children and young people run away because they've got a machete on them yeah. or because or they've got drugs or, on them yeah. you know? so some children run away because they're because they are bang at it sort of thing um so i'm not when i was kind of describing i have got complaints about and, and i think that was a really excellent suggestion there about um, the manner of restraint. I have got a complaint about um, the way some children are restrained. I've had clients, had a particular client who slammed up against a shop window with such force that the plate glass cracked, you, you know, and I could go on and on and on. So th th it does go on and, and body cameras are switched on and off. Mm -hmm. it, it does happen sort of thing. But having said that, you know, police are on the streets confronting really dangerous stuff. And they're doing it, you, you, you know, day in, day out. So I'm not kind of saying, oh, you know, this is, it, 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 it's just trying to find that balance, it, you, you know, just really trying to find that balance. And they do do a really difficult job. They do, you know, sort of thing. Um, but also one of the reasons why I was making that point is then how it disposes the child or young person who's then brought to custody mm. and who then has those same officers beside them when they're asked to engage in the risk assessment process and those same officers who strip search them and sometimes those same officers who interview them and so it, it's and also in terms of trying to divert some of the young youngsters away or engage their trust it just ain't a great start but you know very definitely you've got a mixed bag you've got some children that are running away because they're just really scared and you've got other children who are running away because they have got a freaking machete in their trousers or weed or a drug phone or whatever you know it's mm. difficult mm. i think there was a question as well. i know there's a lot of questions left in the room i'm really sorry that that we don't have time to take them all because we have another session coming up very soon and we need about five minutes to turn to to mm. to, to spread out the next set of handouts uh, so we'll take a short five-minute break. What I will say is, during the break, feel free to catch any of the commentators and speakers. Plus, after the event, or after the second session, there's a drinks and, uh, and nibbles reception. So you should feel free to catch our speakers at that point as well. Uh, well welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Dyson. I've been asked to chair this session. I'm delighted to do so. Obviously, we've moving from different areas of the criminal law during the assize sessions. We've just moving from 
types of criminal procedure and evidence. We're now moving to some doctrinal criminal law and the paper we would have otherwise had would have been more criminal justice. This is uh, in the very nature of what the assize tries to do. And you also saw a wonderful example of uh, academic work linking into legal practitioners work. And we're going to see that here as well with a paper uh, by an academic with a comment by uh, both a, a leading judge and a leading practitioner. So it's exactly the kind of format we're aiming for. And we're very grateful to our speakers and to all of you. So this paper, uh, you should all have a handout for, it's around the, uh, the room, Necessary Self-Defense. Uh, James Mannering is a fellow and director of studies in law at Homerton College, University of Cambridge. Uh, we previous, I previously knew him in his in, uh, anterior existence in Oxford. Uh, and I'm very I'm delighted he's here. And our two commentators are Melanie Simpson KC and Her Honor Judge Angela Rafferty KC. Now, uh, because of the time limits, I'm just going to ask that we go straight on to present the paper, if that's okay. James. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. It's really nice to be back at UCL. I also taught here for a year, so it's very familiar uh, to be back. So the title of the paper is Necessary Self-Defense. So just to clarify, there is a lot of discussion about the relationship between self-defense and necessity as a distinct, arguably extant, but not exactly definitively extant defense in the criminal law. This paper is not about the relationship between those two separate defenses. It is about the necessity element internal to self-defense. So just to clarify that at the outset. So I'll start with a bit of legal history. Traditionally, if you go back to the early authorities on self-defense, I'm talking Victorian and before, you would see two conditions of lawful self-defense, proportionality and necessity. So the defendant had to use force which was both proportionate to the threat they faced and necessary in the circumstances. That was the traditional two elements of lawful self-defense. Now, in 1967, Parliament intervened a little bit in this area. In the Criminal Law Act, 1967, Section 3, they created a new offence, or new, put it on a statutory footing, arguable, a new defence of prevention of crime, and they said that you must use reasonable force in the prevention of crime. So you had the two traditional conditions for self-defense, proportionality and necessity. And then when it came to prevention of crime, you had reasonableness. And the problem is here that what is self-defense is also usually going to be preventing a crime, the crime that would have happened to you did you not intervene and defend yourself. So then the question is, what's the relationship between prevention of crime and self-defense? Do we use the reasonableness standard from the CLA 1967, or do we use the traditional common law elements of proportionality and uh, necessity? Now, if we step forward to 2008, Parliament intervenes again with the Criminal Justice and Immigration Act, Section 76, and they kind of try to clarify the law by bundling up the traditional common law defenses of self-defense and also defense of another, defense of property with the prevention of crime defense, and they use the test of reasonableness. So you have to use reasonable force in self-defense. So it seems like the kind of CLA 1967 language and test and standard of reasonableness is going to be the main thing we're interested in, rather than the traditional common law doctrines of proportionality and necessity. However, they haven't disappeared, those old common law tests, because in the 2008 Act, they say that force is not reasonable in any of these defenses if it is disproportionate. So the old proportionality consideration is now a sub-consideration of whether force is reasonable, which is a necessary requirement for self-defense to be lawful. It's a little bit complicated, but hopefully that makes sense. So then what about the traditional necessity condition? Where did that go? Parliament in 2008 did not say that force is not reasonable if it is unnecessary. They did not say that in the way that they said it for proportionality. Instead, they said that one consideration going towards whether force is reasonable is whether the defendant honestly and instinctively believed it was necessary. But if it's just one consideration going towards whether force is reasonable, that implies that it's not a definitive or necessary requirement, it's just one consideration among others going towards the reasonableness of force use. So on the handout, I've contrasted 
these two ways of thinking about necess necessity in self-defense. The statutory test makes it one factor among others relevant to whether force is reasonable and therefore lawful, whereas the traditional common law said that it must be necessary any force you use. And so there's an implicit tension between how Parliament uh, redescribed or clarified the law in 2008 and the traditional common law idea that it must be necessary force. It's not a huge difference, and we'll maybe talk about this in the comments, the difference this makes, but it does seem to me a tension in the sources. So I'm very happy to say that whether the defendant uses necessary force is relevant to whether that force was reasonable. Very happy with that. What I'm less happy with is the traditional common law idea that force must be necessary. It must be. That's a requirement of self-defense. That is the target of this talk and this paper. And I call this a necessity requirement, i.e. a necessary condition of the lawfulness of self-defense is that the defendant used uh, necessary force. So there's two different senses of necessity there. Okay. So that's the historical background to the paper, which is not in the paper. So apologies to the, the commenters that this is all coming out of the blue. This is just to contextualize it. So from what follows is what I will be talking about and what I did write in the paper. So why do I not like the idea that the fact that force was necessary should be a necessary condition of lawful self-defense? What's wrong with that? Three things, and I've put them on the handout. First, there's no case where this actually is the ratio. Not a single case that I can find. If anyone can contradict me, be very happy, because then I'll move on to a normative critique and say it shouldn't be the case. But as far as I can tell, there's no authority which makes this the ratio. Now, there's no shortage of cases which say that this is the law. The defendant must use necessary force in self-defense. And it's unnecessary, it's not lawful. So there's no shortage of cases saying this, but as far as I can tell, it's entirely obiter. So that's the first objection. Second objection, relatedly, not every single authority frames the elements of self-defense in this way. You do have authorities which offer necessity-free formulations of the element. And in the paper, I put some references to those cases. Of course, if it wasn't relevant to the case, that's also not going to be ratio. So that doesn't get us much further. So the core of the paper and the core of my objection is that all of the massed authorities which talk about the idea that force must be necessary for it to be lawful in self-defense, they don't speak with one voice. They use very different tests when you dig into it, importantly different tests, which would affect the outcomes in different cases. And so what I drill into in this paper is these differences in the way that these tests are formulated in the authorities and how they lead to divergent ideas of what the necessity requirement actually entails. So that is what I'll talk about now. So you might think I can't count because the second section is section three. That's just so that it lines up with the paper because there is an intermediate section two which is clarifying some things which uh, I could talk about later, but I'll leave it aside for now. Okay, so three questions I think we should ask of any purported necessity requirement. What must be necessary? How necessary must that thing be? And necessary to what end? These are the three questions. Okay, what must be necessary? Now, standardly, people talk about necessary force in self-defense. So that's a natural place to start. The problem is that it's controversial whether self-defense actually does require force in the first place, okay? There's some authorities which say you only get the defense of self-defense where you use force, but other authorities are not so happy with that, okay? Now, if it's true that we need force to use self-defense, so punching someone, an example of force, that's something that could be done in self-defense, if it's necessary that the offense in question involves force, then it would be pretty straightforward to say that what must be necessary is that force was necessary. But if it's not true that self-defense requires you to use force, for example, what if you drive through a red light to escape your assailant? Can you plead self-defense in that case? 
If the answer is yes, then there is no force requirement in the law of self-defense. And if there's no force requirement in the law of self-defense, it would be very weird for the law to turn around and say, it must be necessary to use force. Because with one hand, it's saying it's necessary to use force, and the other, it's saying it's not. That would be odd. So I'm not going to try and settle that controversy here. That's a whole paper of its own. I personally prefer the view that self-defense should not require the use of force. Um, I think if you could either run over your assailant with your car or escape them by going through a red light, if you get self-defense for running them over, you should also get self-defense for running through the red light. It's an a fortiori argument. But that's, that's my personal view. Now, there's further problems regardless of which avenue we go down. Let's say that force is in fact necessary for lawful self-defense. Only offenses using force, right. Well, what does the necessity requirement say? How much force has to be necessary? Different authorities offer different views. Some authorities say that as long as some force was necessary, that's fine. You get through the condition, through the hurdle that you used necessary force. Other authorities though, they say that the degree of force you used has to be necessary. Very different views. Right? It might be necessary to use some force, but you used over-the-top force. Now, I prefer the view that if we're going to go with the force requirement, then we should go for the some force view, because there's a further condition, the proportionality condition, which seems far better suited to the degree of force question. So that would be my preferred view, or the authorities don't speak with one voice. Okay, my, my ultimately preferred view, though, is that self-defense should not require a force requirement at all. But then that leaves it ambiguous. What must be necessary if it's not force? So some authorities, they say that the very precise action the defendant took had to be necessary. This is how they frame the test. The very precise action they took. So if you punch the defendant, then it has to be that punching which was necessary. Now, I think that's too restrictive because what if you could have alternatively kicked the defendant you not get self-defense then if you could kick the left leg or the right leg just because there's two options? That seems to me far too restrictive. So instead, my preferred view on, on the question of what must be necessary is that the defendant took an action which fell within the set of actions, at least one of which within that set was necessary. I can see people frowning with good reason. This is rather a mouthful, right? And I don't pretend there's a single authority which supports this view. But I think that if we think through some hypotheticals, this is the most attractive version of the answer to the question of what must be necessary. There was a set of actions, at least one of which was necessary, and the action you took fell within that set. It's not a, not a pleasant mouthful, I'm afraid. It is a mouthful. But I think that's the best way of interpreting uh, an attractive version of the requirement, and it has absolutely no authoritative support in the case law. Next question. We've talked about what must be necessary. Next question is, how necessary must that thing be? And I'm going to revert to talking about the use of force, because it's much less of a mouthful. I just say that the defendant's using force, but bear that previous discussion in mind. Okay, so how necessary must the defendant's force have been? Two views that you'll see in the literature. Traditionally, you go back to the, the old cases, they would say that the force the defendant used had to be absolutely necessary, strictly necessary. This is the language that I put on the sheet here, strictly necessary. Alternatively, in more modern authorities, you see a, a weaker sort of phrasing, weaker language. The authorities talk about reasonable necessity, or even in the case of one leading textbook, reasonable or necessary. Okay. Now, this is a very important difference. Absolutely necessary, the force the defendant used, versus reasonably necessary. An important difference. And to illustrate this, think about the standard of proof in a criminal trial. The jury have to be sure that the defendant committed the offense, that all of the necessary elements of the offense were present. They have to be sure. Now, if a judge directed a jury, they have to be reasonably sure about these elements of the offense, that would be a blatant misdirection, 
right? You can't ask the jury, are you reasonably sure that this is the right guy? No, they have to be sure. And so the difference between reasonably necessary and strictly necessary is rather an important one, right? It would make a difference. So which is it? The answer is actually quite clear. It cannot be strictly necessary, the use of force. The reason being that if force had to be strictly necessary, then if you had the option to retreat, then it wasn't strictly necessary to use force. So it would imply that it was a retreat requirement. Because if you could either drive off or stay and defend yourself, it can't be strictly necessary to defend yourself with force because you could have driven off. But the law, and the law used to contain a requirement to retreat if you wanted to rely on lawful self-defense. So this was quite consistent with the old authorities. Force had to be strictly necessary, and therefore you have to retreat if you get the chance. But in the modern law, there is no such requirement to retreat. You do not have to retreat. It won't rule out lawful self-defense if you choose to stay and defend yourself rather than retreating. And as such, it cannot be strictly necessary to use force. That can't be the requirement the law imposes. It must be something weaker. And in the authorities, we'll see that the language of reasonable necessity is probably what the answer is. Now the problem is, what does that mean? What does it mean to be reasonably necessary? So in another life, and another hat, I'm more of a philosopher than uh, a lawyer. And if you ask a philosopher, what does it mean that something is necessary? They'll say, well, what do you mean? It's, it's, it's strictly necessary, right? There's no like lesser version of necessity. It's, it's a, in all possible worlds, the philosophers like to talk about, okay? A necessary condition means what it says on the tin. It's not a maybe necessary condition. It's something which has to be present. So the idea of reasonable necessity, I think really means what Smith and Hogan say, which is reasonable or necessary. But if force has to be reasonable, it no longer has to be necessary because these are different ideas, different standards. So I think the best understanding actually effectively eliminates the necessity requirement once we think about what it means to, to be how necessary on that question. Final issue. Necessary to what end? So if I wanted to play uh, a chord, I would have three notes. Three notes are necessary. If I wanted to play a concerto, I need more than three notes. So the relevant end of self-defense will affect the set of actions which are necessary to achieving it. So the obvious answer to what necessary to what end is necessary to the end of self-defense or defense of another or defense of property. That's the standard answer. The problem is there's some authorities which have a somewhat more generous interpretation of this idea. What if your force was not necessary to defend yourself, but really a preliminary to defending yourself, preparing the goods which would be necessary, the weapons, for example, when the bad guy comes to get you. There's some authority for the idea that this might be permissible. So the idea that the end of preventing an attack in the future if you want, I'm citing authorities. They're, they're in the paper, which I can uh, give out to people if you're skeptical about the, the authorities there. Furthermore, there's authorities where the defendant was told, don't come around this, this side of town, because if you do, we'll beat you up. Case of Field, I think it is. Not the recent one. Uh, so if you come to this area of town, we'll beat you up. So if you go to that area of town, you know that you're going to have to fight off some bad guys. Does that mean that you don't have to go to that area of town? No. You are allowed to go to the area of town, and therefore you are allowed to take on the bad guys if they come and get you. And so that kind of implies that once again, it wasn't really necessary for you to use self-defense. You didn't have to go to the area of town after all. So some academics propose that what should be necessary to what end, the answer is the end of vindicating your civil rights in some way, as opposed to physically defending yourself against an attack. Uh, so Simister and Sullivan is one leading textbook, and they frame it in this way. That's the end of preventing yourself from having your rights violated, even if it's not your bodily integrity necessarily. So that's a weaker version of the necessity principle once again. So if you line up these three questions and the answers that I've given to you as to possible answers to these questions, we get to this table on D on the handout on page two. 
Some of them are less demanding answers, and some of them are more demanding answers. It'd be very demanding of the, the law of self-defense said that the precise degree of force you used must be strictly necessary to defend yourself. It would be much less demanding for the law to say that some force had to be necessary, reasonably necessary, to vindicate your civil rights. And of course, various different combinations of these ambiguities could be chosen. But this is the starkest way of distinguishing the two. The necessity requirement might be extremely demanding, or it might be very permissive. And the authorities have some support for all of these interpretations. So although I've been suggesting my preferred view on some of these points, ultimately, I, I, I kind of line up with the less demanding side of the equation. I think that we shouldn't require that the defendant use precisely the amount of force and no more that was necessary. We should be pretty flexible about this. They used some force or their action fell within the set of actions, at least one of which was necessary. It has to be reasonably necessary, not strictly necessary, which effectively means reasonable, not necessary. And vindicating rights, maybe that's sufficient rather than physically defending yourself. But if that's true, we've effectively replaced the necessity requirement with the thing that I started with, which is on the face of the statute. The fact that the defendant used necessary force in some description is relevant to whether it's reasonable, but it's not a strict condition of lawful self-defense. So effectively, I'm reaching the point where I'm happy to say goodbye to the necessity condition. It's just one factor that feeds into whether the use of force in this occasion was reasonable. And it's not a necessary condition of lawful self-defense. How long do I have? Five minutes, please. Five minutes, okay. So the final section then, if we, if you follow me and you don't like the necessity requirement, which of course I'm sure lots of people will disagree, but if we don't like the necessity requirement, then does that mean we just kind of abolish it entirely? I think there is room for a, a replacement which gets some of the purported benefits of a necessity requirement without some of the drawbacks. And the replacement that I've suggested is a motivation requirement. And that's on the handout on section four. So the idea is that it should be a necessary condition of lawful self-defense that the defendant acted as they did in order to defend themselves. It does not say that it was necessary to defend themselves. It's just saying that of the actions they could have taken, the reason why they took the action was in fact to defend themselves. I think this gets a lot of the benefits of the necessity requirement. So defendants who are sometimes said not to have used necessary force, I think what's really going on is that they're just not acting in self-defense at all. So think about the provocation rule. If you provoke someone into pushing back, then they can't, uh, you can't rely on self-defense when you then attack them back. So we don't want to vindicate bullies who start pushing the victim. The victim pushes back and then the bully responds by punching. We don't want to vindicate bullies like that. And we have a fairly complex set of pr uh, provocation rules. This is not in terms of the, the partial defense to homicide, which you might be aware of, but provocation to deny the use of lawful self-defense. Some complicated rules about that. And I think what's really underlying those complicated rules is the defendant wasn't acting in self-defense at all because that wasn't their reason for acting. So I think that this motivation requirement gets a lot of the benefits of the necessity requirement without the same drawbacks of being far too demanding or just incoherent. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to any comments. James, can I, can I say um, thank you very much for your um, paper. It was very thought provoking. Um, and as a practitioner, it's not really something that I confess that I've thought very much about. Um, as, as I understand the paper, you, you argue that the um, necessity requirement in self-defense is formulated inconsistently. It's dealt with incompatibly by the authorities and ultimately um, it's too restrictive. Um, 
Now, what you say is that necessity would remain a, a relevant factor in deciding the reasonableness of the um, force use, but the, the heart of the defence as we know it um, would no longer be necessary self-defence, but instead be directed to whether the act was motivated um, by the act was motivated by self-defence. Um, now, in criminal practice, um, I've not actually found um, self-defence a, a very difficult defence to run. Um, generally, it's considered um, quite generous, actually. Um, and you all will know that um, self-defence is actually um, founded in common sense, because it's common sense, really, that if someone is under attack or believes that they are about to be attacked, that they are entitled to defend themselves um, as long as they use no more than reasonable force. Um, and the way that the law is currently structured is that um, if a defendant believes or may have believed um, that it was necessary to use force to defend themselves, um, then that's the first limb and it's subjective. Um, so it's actually what the defendant himself or herself actually, actually thought. Um, and because it's subjective, um, I find that it's actually in practice quite easily passed. Um, it, it's available even if there's a mistake of fact, which I think that you actually think that is one of the problems with the, the current law. Um, and um, as long as it's genuinely held, um, even if the um, mistake was not reasonable, then the law would still give protection. Um, and in your paper, I think that you um, draw this distinction, you say that actually that's quite um, inconsistent and, and, it, and it can lead to inconsistent results. Um, so there's a subjective element um, as the law as we currently understand it and an objective um, question, which is the amount of force used, was it reasonable? Um, and, and even actually in that, it, it contains a subjective element because it includes the dangers as the defendant honestly believed them to be. Um, so it, in practice, I don't actually find that self-defense um, is that restrictive because, you know, it's uh, widely available, not to just yourself, but also to protect others, protection of property, prevention of crime, um, even to conduct a lawful arrest. Um, and um, it includes a preemptive strike. So um, someone doesn't actually have to have hit you first. And, you know, I've successfully defended in, in cases where there has been a preemptive strike. Um, and even, I mean, you, you mentioned sometimes if the tables are turned, um, you can still have a, a defense, even if the defendant was the um, initial uh, aggressor. Um, so, Self-defense, generally, I've not found that it is that restrictive. Um, you know, it's not precluded. There's no um, duty to retreat. Um, and so I actually just straw poll today. Um, I'm actually in trial at the, the Old Bailey, and I went up to the bar mess, and, and I, I asked at least 10 um, barristers, um, including about six um, KCs, what they thought uh, of self-defense and whether they thought that um, the necessity um, element of it was um, too restrictive, whether it needed to be changed. And actually, the general consensus seemed to be that it, it's quite straightforward. It's quite an easy defence to run. It's quite generous. Um, and um, obviously, um, her Honour Judge Rafferty will explain more about this. But um, in, in terms of summing up a case to the jury, um, it, it doesn't seem to be um, quite overly complicated. Um, but what's really useful um, in your paper is the way that you dissect the word necessary in, in a way that um, we don't perhaps think about it. Um, and, um, you know, you, you, you separate um, a defendant's belief into what they believe to be necessary and factual necessity. Um, so that the question would be, what was defend was the defendant's belief that it was necessary, in fact necessary. Um, but but that would take away um, mistake, a mistaken belief, which currently is the law. Um, did, I mean, is that something that you thought about and you thought, well, actually, 
Um, if you've got a mistaken belief that it shouldn't be um, protected anyway, I, 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 don't, I don't know what your views are about that. Yeah, I guess I should respond after the full okay. comment. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the things that I, I thought. And um, and also that would become um, part subjective, but also part objective on, on your uh, analysis. Um, and I wondered if actually that that would be overcomplicating, um, which at the, mo what at the moment seems to be quite um, a straightforward um, defence subjective objective and uh, you know i mean uh, in practice i haven't found that self-defense is something which jurors really struggle with because you know ultimately it is kind of self it is kind of common sense and what is reasonable um you know even that's common sense if i punch you in your face you can't pick up the glass and hit me around the head with it because that would be over the top and excessive and um, jurors seem to uh, understand that. Um, but the way that you dissected in your paper, the word um, necessary, I actually found very, very interesting. Um, you know, first of all, you ask, okay, well, if force is necessary, well, how much force, um, you know, how, how much force is necessary? How, how is that, um, how, how is that dealt with? Um, and I think that in your um, talk just now, um, you talked to, about um, maybe reducing actions into um, a set of different actions, um, and at least one of which would be necessary. Um, so you, you could have quite a few actions, but as long as one was, was necessary, that would come within self-defense. Um, but what you also said was that, um, that this interpretation could mean that defendants could use unnecessary force and take unnecessary actions, and yet they would still benefit from self-defense. Um, and that's something which um, that I, I, I struggled with, actually, because um, if you're using force, which is actually not necessary, um, or you're taking unnecessary actions, well, why should you have any protection from the law for that? Um, and, and within that question of, well, how much force is necessary? Um, I, I'm not convinced, actually, that that's a problem that needs to be fixed. Because, I mean, it, it's trite law um, to, to say that um, jur jurors are routinely directed that when they're looking at the force that's been used, that they're always told that, you know, a person using the force may not be able to weigh to a nicety the degree of force in the heat of the moment. Um, and, um, and that actually um, could cover um, that particular point, it seems to me, um, because you know, when we're looking at self-defense and we're thinking about, well, you know, it's common sense. Um, well, actually, it's also about instinct, isn't it? Um, if you're attacked, you know, in the heat of the moment, you can't actually judge um, exactly the precise amount of force. And that the law already um, recognizes that. Um, so, you know, that that's in relation to one of the points that you make about necessary. And then you turn to... Um, how necessary and that's the point that you um that you say well what if the defendant and um, doesn't choose the, the most moderate action um but choose another one but another one which is also reasonable um you know why shouldn't they be covered and it, it is that you know choosing between a punch and a kick which would be you know that the most moderate or the most reasonable in those circumstances um, and I'm not sure if whether we need to actually go into that in as much detail rather than, you know, actually the, the law as it stands um, actually protects someone who may have gone a little bit over the top just because it's in the heat of the, 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 the heat of the moment. And then you also ask, well, to what end um, it's necessary, but to what end? Um, and in your paper, you, you argue that if necessity must be indexed to force um, used to defend oneself, then it, it would not cover end of rights vindication. And in your paper, you give a, um, an example about, I think you call it the pub example, um, 
which I mean, I'm sure everyone will read it. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, th I suppose that's an, another conversation about whether, um, you know, self-defense should actually cover um, someone's rights um, and feeling that their rights are, are vindicated. Um, and what you say in one of your examples is that um, if C, I think this is the pub example, sorry, that if C threatens to attack D unless D leaves the pub and D responds by forcibly pushing C, um, that you think in your paper that D should be protected by the law um, because D has been told to leave the pub um, or he's going to be threatened um, and um, responds by pushing, but there'd be no violence. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I, and I know that there are better lawyers here than me, but I, I'm not sure whether um, D wouldn't be able to argue self-defense on the basis of a preemptive strike anyway. I mean, it may be arguable. Um, I mean, likewise, you, you mentioned in your paper mugging example, um, and um, where, you know, someone was going to be, be mugged, but they were able to run very fast and they didn't need to resort to force, um, but instead they chose to push someone away. Um, again, um, they may already have a defense um, because they are entitled to preemptive action. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not sure whether it's a problem that, that needs to um, be fixed. I mean, I do see in your paper when you talk about unfairness um, and you mention these examples and then you, you mention an example um, and you call it the tattoo example where um, someone um, is, is walking down the street and they're, uh, you know, accosted by someone who is, you know, who's got a lot of tattoos, presumably you've used tattoos because you want to make them sound scary, <laughs> but um, they're, just, they're just asking for the person for the time, but the person, missed, you know, just takes one look at them and, um, and punches them because they believe at that time that they are going to be attacked. Um, and I, I think that the tenet of your paper is, well, well why should that person have um, protection when they're actually they've got a biased belief um and so that there is some you know inconsistency in, in the in the in the law um but but you know sometimes you know some undeserving defendants will get protection of the law um but but it's a, a balancing act actually so um I, I'm I'm not certain um that the law really does need to be changed. Um, I mean, what you say is that the heart of self-defense should be really whether the conduct was reasonable rather than whether it was necessary. Um, and I do actually see some force in that. I mean, and there is some, you know, overlap actually, because ultimately, you know, the law's not going to protect you if your actions are not reasonable. Um, but the, you know, the counter argument also could be, well, you know if the conduct is unnecessary well how then is it reasonable um i think would be one argument um there so um ultimately i, I do think that it's a really thought-provoking um article um and for, for those of you that that read it there's um in the footnote i think it's the footnote where you deal with the criminal damage act um and um and, and what you say in the footnote is that the um, in relation to the Criminal Damage Act um, and the second limb of that defence that the defendant did so believe in and um, that the court actually has changed or turned a subjective test into an objective test. Um, and my fear actually is, well, if your proposed motivation test were to be adopted, um, is there a fear that the, the Court of Appeal would do the same um, and, you know, with that test of motivation and try and make it more um, objective um, than subjective. And at the moment, actually, um, self-defense because of the first limb is subjective and quite generous. So that, that's just one of the, um, the you know, the, the thoughts that I have. And also, um, uh, you've probably thought about this, but what about um, where there are mixed motivations? 
So, you know, obviously your test would be motivation based, but what where there are more than one motivation, your motivation might be to arrest someone, but it might also be part self-defense, but it might also be part revenge um, or motivated by anger. Um, so I, I was quite interested to, to, to find your, or to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Is this microphone working? It's more really for people online than people. Okay. So self-defense. When when I was at university, I started by studying English and I took the view very quickly that English was all about making really simple things like love and beauty and pain and rage quite complicated. And so I got out and I needed the money. So I went into law for my second part of my degree. And I discovered that the opposite appeared to be true in this uh, place that I was studying. Really complicated things, human behavior, sets of circumstances. We were trying to codify and trying to somehow control. And when I read James's paper, the same terror of the law arose in me again, and my mind split into those two parts, which was, I don't understand it. I'm scared that everybody's going to see that. Paul Jarvis has sent me some notes on it. I don't even understand what they mean. <laughs> um, he's going on and on about justificatory, excusatory defences. And then I just thought, just step back, Rafferty. You're not stupid. And I realised that what you were doing is that wonderful thing that we do when we study law, which is actually microscopically look at what we're doing in the legislation and in the authorities. And so I've got five points to make. <clears throat> um, you don't need to write them down, they're not that great. But um, the uh, and I'm speaking from a really from a practice point of view. The law of self-defense is not broken. And I don't think there's any need to fix it. It is actually universally understood. The fact that Melanie is a defence practitioner, mostly, you don't prosecute at all, do you? Only, thinks it's generous should be a very clear indication that it's working. The prosecution quite often get annoyed because as soon as it's raised in a trial, then it has to be left. And some judges, as you will know on the authorities, who haven't left self-defense in situations where the judge thought, this is rubbish, I've got into quite significant hot water. So in most cases where it's raised, it's left. And the classic pronouncement from what case, Peter Rook, the one I can't remember, the one that everybody knows way back, still works. When you read it, it's beautiful. I'll, he'll remember it in a minute and tell me what it is. Sorry? That one. Uh, and is it Lord Lane? So. Yes. And read it and imagine it read to juries. It's perfect. Sometimes they just get it. Like Turnbull, potentially, he just got it and it still works. That's my first point. <clears throat> Having said that, that's not to say that it, it, in, it can't be difficult. My second point is that in, in directing the jury about this, as I am doing day in, day out, and it's raised in most cases of murder in some form or another. And these, this is what the jury has told them. So I want you all to listen to this as lawyers and as human beings. And if you're ever doing jury service and, and think, say the tattoo situation, say the person has punched the tattoo, tattooed guy for no reason, guy or was it a woman, whatever. And what you'll remember is once the issue of self-defense is raised, so puncher of tattooed had said, I thought he was going to kill me. I saw that tattoo on his arm coming down the street and I just lost it. And I've got PTSD and I'm not well. And you know, all the stuff that Melanie will be putting very articulately forward for him. And so he was just walking past me and I thought I was going to be killed. So I hit him. So he's raised it. Thereafter, it is for the prosecution to disprove it. And they'll have to do that either through cross-examination or hoping for the jury's common sense. Those who are 
are acting in lawful self-defense are not guilty. It is a complete defense. So that's why it's so important. If you're acting in lawful self-defense, you aren't guilty of murder. It's not a partial defense. It's not diminished responsibility. It's not loss of control. You're off. You get off. You're not guilty. You've not acted unlawfully, which is why I think it's raised quite a lot in practice. The There are two aspects that you tell the jury about. First is that there has to be a belief that there is a need to use force. I'm really interested in your issue about force, but I want to come back to that on my last point around the carrying of knives. Uh, but I'm really interested in that. But at the moment, juries have to be told that there has to be, it, uh, the prosecution must disprove that there was a belief that there is a need to use force. So think about tattoo situation. Is the jury going to even get past that? The jury's just going to think there was no need here, nothing else. And the use of no more than reasonable force in the circumstances as the, I'm going to calling this person tattoo person, but uh, inking person, believe them to be, it is, uh, there's a gloss on it. If you're a householder and lots of people think this is a complication too far, if you're a householder, you have a separate enhanced defense. So if someone comes into your house to steal from you, then the test becomes what you, that you genuinely believe that it was necessary to use force to defend yourself and that it wasn't grossly proportionate. I'm not even going to go into, I had a case about that. It's, it's a mess. It's worth a paper is my, my view. But classic self-defense, the jury will then be asked to apply the subjective and then the objective test. And most cases are pretty clear cut in terms of where juries can decide it. So when you're drafting a route to verdict as a judge to take the jury through these legal steps, it's not really hard to, to work out how to do it. Um, Self-defense doesn't apply, you tell the jury, if the, if the jury's sure that tattoo man did not believe that he needed to defend himself. And if they're sure that, that he didn't need to defend himself, that's it. It doesn't arise as a defense. That's very clear for juries to understand when you write it down in a question. It's a very clear pronouncement of the law. And if the jury are sure that the force so, uh, he or she used was more than reasonable in the circumstances, was, was more than was reasonable in the circumstances, then it doesn't apply. So again, the jury are looking at the circumstances. So if the force used was disproportionate over the top, then it cannot be reasonable. So we're getting into reasonable necessity. Once we start throwing in necessity, I'm telling you, everybody's minds are going to boggle <coughs> in, in the criminal courts. It, it, this is a, such a practical, workaday, important defence that the fact that I think it's not broken um, means that if we start to tinker with it, we'll start to get lots of new court of appeal authorities. Motivation is a very loaded term in the criminal law. Juries are always told the prosecution don't have to prove motive. And I wonder if there are not so many authorities in which the ratio deals with necessity because, because the law isn't broken on it. But I haven't read all the authorities recently, so I don't know. That, that's a comment that I would make, just think about whether, in fact, some of the authorities that are thrown up are so unusual that it's a sign that the law is working. And then juries are often told about what... Melanie was saying about the heat of the moment that's very important and that does bring me to something that Paul Jarvis said that I did understand uh, which is that self-defense is a justificatory defense what would happen I posit if we changed it to an excusatory defense so at the moment it, it's there it, what's going on in the mind of the person who defends is saying that they defended themselves if they're thinking are they thinking it's necessary for me to stab this tattooed man or hit him? If they're not thinking and it's instinctive and, and all of their personal, then the whole, it, so the cognition element of self-defense is very interesting and it's where a lot of the forensic battles start in court. Can I rely on my client's PTSD, my client's mental health, all of those things? So it, I can see how it could become quite complicated, but at the moment, it's a justificatory defence, not an excusatory defence, and a complete defence. And I don't think many criminal lawyers would want it the other way around. 
So the duty to retreat, the jury just consider that. That's a matter of, of fact for the jury. And remember that self-defense is always usually left for juries to decide. If a plea is accepted on the basis of self-defense, if a plea is accepted on the basis of excessive self-defense, usually that's written down and the judge knows. So usually in the Crown Court, juries are trying these cases, not judges, because it is a complete defense. So there are cultural aspects to the defense that are very interesting, what well, might have been self-defense or considered self-defense in an era where there were no knives, may need to, really may need to think about it now. But I raise it as a question. And so those are a rush through the directions that a jury will be told. And I hope you can all see, I hope you can. They're pretty clear, aren't they? What well, hands up who would find the guy who, Beat the tattoo, well, guilt, not guilty on the grounds of self defense. Right, say that the tattoo man had a big machete hanging out of the side of his coat that the guy got a glimpse of up the street, about six meters up the street, and he punched him. Who would find him acting in self defense? You're all thinking, well, he could have run away. Why did he not just cross the street? As the guy's coming closer, he didn't might and he see he sees the machete at the moment. So it's very fact specific self-defense. Right. Am I going on too long? So I think the cognition point that Paul Jarvis has raised is really, really interesting about what goes on in the mind of the of a person who defends themselves. Because these days, with the advent of my last point, knives, we have got a whole cohort of people in this city who are carrying knives and who come from situations where they've seen their friends stabbed, they've seen people killed, there is so much murder. And if you don't carry a knife, you feel unprotected. Am I wrong? Mm -hmm. And yet, what usually happens is if you're carrying the knife, that will become evidence of your bad character, not your need to defend yourself. Because of course, we can't have people on the street with knives. So we are seeing an awful lot of cases where defence barristers are trying to explore this reality with juries, that the fact their client had a knife down their trousers doesn't necessarily mean that they were going out for aggression or hoping that there was a fight. And I just think it's very interesting. I, have, I really don't have any answers. Even when the, the knife is produced and you're still arguing self-defence. Yes, or the recent sort of potential duking thing you know, these are really granular things. So a, a big, in the old days, it was a Stanley knife or a kitchen knife. These days, have you all seen a zombie knife? It's like that with big, and it's very like what children play with, those swords that children hack at each other with. And a lot of it, um, when you take that knife out and a human body comes into contact with it, it doesn't take very much for the human body's abdomen to be penetrated very deeply by that knife without you really feeling very much in the knife. And you have situations where there's a culture of what's called duking. I didn't know about this quite recently, which is you've got your knife, you don't really seem like a, a, an agent in front of, that's not a technical legal term, in front of your friends, but you really don't want to hurt anybody badly. So you duke them cut to the murder trial and some prosecution barrister saying to you, well, what are you, what's going to happen if you hit somebody with a knife? You're obviously going to do really serious harm. You're going to have a lot to explain if you're an inarticulate 15 year old person. I'm just raising these as questions. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but the, the area of knives is some, is a situation where I think we need to think again about the evidential basis in terms of self-defense. Those are my comments. I don't, I welcome this level of scrutiny. I'd love you to apply it to the household of defence and let me know what the answer is. Thank you. That's all I have to say. So what we would normally do is move straight on to some questions. We have about 20 minutes. I'm also conscious that uh, James was asked a couple of direct questions, so he might have things he wants to work in. But could we start with a few questions and see if they unleash those? And otherwise, we'll try and make sure James gets some chance, because at the very least, this is work he's doing that he'd like to offer, and your comments and thoughts might help him develop it, um, which is also a very important part of this. So please, 
who has a question or a comment? I've got about 16, so uh, it'd be much better that you guys ask them than me. I will try to help you. Oh, God. Please. And even though we might know who you are, please, if you have a moment, just say your name so that others in the room will recognize you. Thanks, I'm Penny Lewis, I'm the Criminal Law Commissioner. Um, this is a bit of a cheeky question because the government has asked us to take on a project looking at defenses for victims who kill their abusers. So I'm interested in the description of self-defense as working well or not being broken. Do you think that description is true for cases where a victim of domestic abuse has killed their abuser? Who, who's all of us? All probably not me. Yeah. What you? Um, I'm trying to think of some cases. Have you had any cases recently? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, um... It's a, it's a very difficult one, isn't it? Um, because, I mean, we've been talking about... Oh, sorry. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about self-defence um, generally, um, whereas when you get into the domestic element, it, it you know, it, it, it can become more complicated um, because it's, it's not just a one-off, is it? It's not just a something that's happened in the nightclub or on the street. It's it's often something which has been going on for years and years. Um, and and actually that probably would deserve a, a paper on its own. Well, also I'm thinking if it's homicide, if it was a homicide case, if there was a kill, you said kill, then the order of defences is quite clear. Mm. So if it was a long-term abusive relationship in which the person then lost control, there's a whole set. So I think it's self-defense first, complete defense, a loss of control in which the judge has to look at all the evidence and see if it can be left with all the tests, qualifying triggers. Very complicated. I quite like it because it's the only time we sometimes get to think about the facts. And then event at the end, if there's any diminished responsibility. So quite often if a person has been abused for years they'll have some kind of adjustment disorder attachment disorder so there'll be three uh defenses potentially to run so i think it does work yeah but it's obviously much much better to get self-defense than it is to end up with loss of control or diminished yes because that's manslaughter yeah yes but if it is truly self-defense what's behind your question what's your concern so the criticism is that sorry thanks that the the requirements of the defense as currently formulated just don't work in a situation where there has been a long build up and there's you know opportunity to leave the relationship um so you know, you're not thinking about a duty to re retreat in a crowded nightclub. You're thinking about a duty to retreat over the past five years. And that that kind of analysis just makes it very, very difficult to successfully argue self-defense. Well, what, what, what has caused this person to act now when they haven't acted all the other times that the defendant has uh, assaulted them or controlled or coerced them? Yes, I can see the evidential problems with that. Do you know, actually, what um, might be quite interesting is um, because at the moment, you know, when we're talking about necessary self-defense and, you know, it's um, defend yourself from an imminent attack. Mm -hmm. And so the necessity is actually tied up with the immediacy of the mm -hmm. action, whereas James's paper is actually taking it um, away from that and saying, well, actually, um, it doesn't have to be immediate um, because it's more about what your motivation is. So, I mean, in that type of case, it, it actually um, might be more beneficial to go um, down the, the, the route of your proposal, which is that self-defense is motivational rather than necessary, um, mm -hmm. because when you've got the necessary element, you've got the immediacy, whereas your argument would take away the immediacy, unless I've unless I've misunderstood your 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 paper. But in terms of public policy or rights, I mean the right to life is up there. And for everybody, really. That's all I'm going to say. But it's an interesting one. James, did you want to at all? 
I'll maybe pass. Ask we could talk after. Okay, we've got France. Yeah, um, Francis Fitzgibbon, and I'm a, a criminal practitioner. Really, it's the sort of mirror image, I think, of the last question, which dealt with the impact of a history of, of past behavior. History of past behavior. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if James's motivation base for self-defense could apply to the future. So that if you think of self-defense in terms not of defending me, but of protecting another, if my if my children are, I, I genuinely genuinely believe at risk of being drowned by rising sea levels. I, I, to what extent can I use force to um, attack the people who I believe are responsible for the rise in sea levels? Such as, well, uh, uh, I, I mean, there's a whole panoply of them, isn't there? Any number of oil companies or, or, or painting the National Gallery or wh wh whoever it may be. Um, I, I can choose my target if I have reason to, reason to think that that individual is responsible for the harm that is, I believe is likely to befall my my children. What do you think the answer against that is? What do I Self-defense from the future. Or what, no, what do you think? Excuse me, I get to ask the question. <laughs> I just don't think that... Yeah. No, I, 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 don't think it, I don't think it works. I, I, I think, I think you'd you need another... To? If you're asking me, I think you'd need another legal category to, to yeah, accommodate yeah. that if that yeah. is thought to be something an acceptable form of behavior so just maybe to kind of tie the two questions together so whether force is is reasonable there can be sub questions which are necessary for it to be reasonable and right now proportionality is one of them it has to be proportionate so i'm not proposing necessarily getting rid of the imminence requirement maybe you, you require an imminent threat in order for it to be reasonable force or whatever conduct you do okay. Um, the motivation requirement was proposed to be in addition rather than a, a complete negation of the reasonableness condition. I didn't have more hands, but there can be. I've got, I know of Mark, and I think, Xiongzhou, was that one? Uh, okay, I think what we'll probably do is I'd like to take Xiongzhou's and I'd like to take one from Mark. And I also want to make sure, James, if you had further replies to anything you were asked, that we can get that in before other questions. I'm still hoping there's more questions in you all. Um, Xiongzhou. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your speaking. Uh, uh, I am Songjo, uh, the academic editor to Oxford IEC. Uh, uh, most of all, uh, very interesting uh, your analysis. Uh, I, I have not seen in Korea uh, or elsewhere, I have not seen such kind of analysis. But one thing is not clear to me. Uh, for now, uh, the purpose of your paper is trying to uh, uh, put it uh, somewhat philosophically to deconstruct the the necessity requirements or just elaborate the necessity requirements. That's my question. So, thank you very much. That, that was going to be exactly kind of what I, I was going to reply. So I had kind of two aims in, in the paper. Uh, so one was, this is the best interpretation of the law. So a, a descriptive question about current English law. And the other one was, if that isn't the law, it should be like this, a normative, evaluative point. And so in terms of the law isn't broken, I think a point that both of you made, um, if that's the case, then I say, great, then this is what the law is. Necessity is not actually a condition of self-defense. Actually, apparently what the judges are telling the juries is to talk in terms of reasonableness. And maybe necessity is a sub-element, a facet of reasonableness, but it's about reasonableness and there's not some extra further necessity condition. If that's how it works, then great. Then all I'm, all I'm suggesting is a uh, that some of the old authorities are maybe explicitly overturned or overruled and the textbooks are a little bit more clear about this and the, the Crown Court compendium would not say the defendant believed there was a need to use force, they would say that it was reasonable just, force. I'm literally just exactly, it, yeah. yeah. So in the, in the paper I cite the Crown Court compendium, which is what the judges use, they say, they ask the juries in terms of was there a need to use force or, and this is a further point, did the defendant believe there was a need to use force I think they should not use that language because it's misleading. And if when the trial develops, they drop that language. If it's, what was the language you said? Uh, it, was, it was an extra point. It was an unnecessary complication. I'm sorry, I can't remember who said that now. Uh, to talk in terms of, in addition, was it necessary? Beyond, was it reasonable? Then great. And that, that, is, that is very helpful. 
um, and I think the law is in a better shape than I feared it might be. Hold on, steady on. <laughs> um, that sounds like we can move over to Mark. Okay, um, so one way to vindicate the idea that there might be a need to use force would be to ask whether recourse to official protection was available. So if there's a police officer standing next to you, then perhaps you don't need to use force yourself. There's a copper around. And I think that's one of the ways in which um, you might want to constrain the self-defense plea. You don't get to play judge jury and ex executioner when there is access to, to official assistance. I think when you discuss the how necessary requirement, you focused on the duty to retreat, um, which you know, I think it's a mis misnomer in any case, but um, that's not the only thing that, that does the work there, right? How necessary might also be, is it reasonably necessary in the sense of, do I have appropriately you know, prompt access to, to, to support? If that's the case, then maybe there is a, a need to, to keep the, the language of necessity, just to refer to, have you exhausted other lawful means before you come to, and, and that's independent of the motivation requirement. Thanks a lot, Mark. So just to reemphasize the, the first point that I don't think necessity is irrelevant to self-defense. I think it is one factor which does and should go towards whether it was reasonable to use force. So in the vast majority of the cases, if there's a, a skirmish or fight going on between two guys and the cop isn't next to them, then it wouldn't be reasonable to resort to force. The question though is, should there be a further like distinct disqualification to use force, um, even in the situations where it might have been reasonable to use self-defense? So take the, 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 the panel discussion we had earlier of kind of young men who are you know, skeptical about the police and disengaged. If they get into a, like a potential scrap and they see some coppers around the corner, are they gonna go and ask the coppers like, oh, can you go and help me out in the fight? I, I don't think so. And in some circumstances, it might be reasonable for them not to turn to official measures. Uh, if there's a really giant guy about to beat him up, uh, he might want to just, you know, swing a punch and leg it. And I can see that being reasonable. But is it necessary? No. If Mark's correct that he could have asked the copper. I mean, I mean, if they could have asked the coppers, that's different. That's different from the example that you've given where, you know, the coppers are around the corner and, and there's a big giant guy about to swing a punch right now. Right. So let's say that there's kind of squaring off. It might happen you know, soon and you could go and get the coppers, but you're really not a fan of the police in general. And maybe you've got reasons for skepticism. Yeah, but so, so here's the thing, right? The, the reasonableness requirement includes, amongst other things, considerations of where, whether it's ne necessary. Yeah. So it's just one of the various requirements that go into the overall determination of yeah. reasonableness. So you don't get to say it's reasonably necessary and this is separate, right? This, this, is, this is part of the, of the analysis that goes to whether it's reasonably necessary. So in terms of the necessity requirement, there's at least two things that it could be doing, right? One is, do you have to retreat if you, if you can? The other thing is, do you have access to, to official help? Um, the answers to both of these may be yes or no, you can have a grid over there. But the point is reasonableness is not decided until you've decided these questions. So you can't say, well, let's assume reasonableness and then what? You see, you see, the argument seems to go, go the wrong way around. Yes, yeah, so I'm not saying we should assume reasonableness. It's a fact-sensitive question. It depends on, on the details. Uh, so I think when you, you phrased it, you said, was it reasonably necessary? I guess that's what I'm pushing back on. That shouldn't be the question. It's just, was it reasonable, full stop? And the fact that it was necessary is a consideration going to reasonableness. Yeah, reasonable is in, in the CJI section 76. Reasonably necessary is Lord Justice Griffiths. Yeah, and exactly. Beckley. And that's what I'm pushing back on. I, I got this I got a small sense that uh, Her Honor Judge Rafferty was thinking something just then. I might have been, I'm not sure I'm willing to share it. Um, I think, uh, I, not, nothing to do with you, Jane. I, I was just thinking about, we're talking about punching, and what I was thinking about without any answers is the cultural context of self-defense with in which I'm steeped and very interested because what's reasonable or necessary for you, for me sitting up here, and what might be considered reasonable and necessary on the streets, two very different things. And so very similar to sexual offences, rape juries, things are changing. But what evidence is being permitted to be presented it is a big question for judges in relation to this type of thing. And usually these days in London, as I keep saying, it's weapons offences. It's not being 
punched in the street or it, it, it's really quite serious significant violence and I'm just wondering I don't know I don't really know what I'm wondering I'm wondering how we can sort of reflect the potential evidential problems on all of the requirements that you've just talked about for for example kids who carry knives all the time uh, at the moment it's used against them all the time I'm not saying that I disagree with that but there's an issue there I mean it's is it necessary I, for them to carry a knife yeah. in the ends um I mean, I, th I think I think I said at the beginning that I did a straw poll of, of barristers today um, and the, virtually all of them said, look, you know, self-defense is not complicated. It's um, it, it's not broken. Why fix it? Um, but one of the comments that that I did get was um, someone said, well, actually, um, it's not necessity that I've got a problem with. Um, it's whether self-defense should be available to someone who's carrying a knife and that was a comment that that actually one of the barristers made so it's quite interesting that you know we're talking about actually the cases and the reality of you know a, quite a lot of self-defense cases which involve knives and that was actually the the, the one comment that I did have about I first think it's a question I, I'm not answering but it. I don't agree know. with that, by the way. Yes. I still think that you know self defense should be available, but that was the that was the only comment that that I had from a um a quite an eminent silk. If you carry a knife, you take the consequences. Yeah, is that basically. Line? Yeah, basically that was the um that that was the view. Uh, Miranda, we've got to wrap we've got to wrap up soon, but I do want to take a question from Miranda. And uh, then we've got to do a couple of minutes uh, just to finish off the evening, but then we have drinks afterwards. So I think the last substantive question. I was just thinking in, in that kind of general forum about the motivation requirement and the challenge of introducing motivation in a context in which judges are constantly telling juries, don't worry about motivation, that's not an element that prosecution have to prove. Of course, we do have in order to kind of components of, you know, I don't know, sort of in terms of robbery, you know, you know in, or robbery, you know, use force at the time of and in order to steal. So we do have those sorts of requirements, but I think it's really complicated. And you mentioned that about um, mixed motivation. And I think, you know, the child who produces the knife, the young person who produces the knife, may be acting in order to defend themselves but they may also be acting in order to maintain their street image a, a range of other motivations and i i wonder how you would manage that or how the judge would do it's really difficult on. and as a, mainly and you know and it, it met their name purpose yeah. well intention as well and so yeah. i mean i like to cross-examine all of you about what your intention is here in this room tonight and if you've got one or others or it, intention which is an ordinary english word we keep telling juries is the central premise now for joint participation cases and again i'm just this is not self-defense but again it's very difficult to stand in front of a jury and talk about a very violent incident you've been involved in and articulate yourself in front of all your friends who are in the dock watching you or your the, the dead person's family and I just wonder if there's some evidential questions that we could be talking about to get to those mixed motivations where the person who is being cross-examined is able to explain. And it ties into something that Peter Rook is here and I do an awful lot of, which is issues around vulnerability and defendants' vulnerability. And a lot of defendants who have these, they could have any motivation, they could be murderous or they might be very scared or... Uh, following the herd, how that's articulated to a jury really interests me. And the extent to which a defendant would be able to maintain their position around self-defense if they were being cross-examined yes. in relation to this motivation requirement. Oh, well, come on, you know. You've got a knife. You can, yeah. yeah. can imagine how hard it would be to hold the knife. Yet the intention, yeah. it, the, the intention that the jury have to consider is that the you know, seconds, potentially, it's that instinctive. It's, it's, it's oh, unfortunately, Jarvis, as usual, puts his finger on it. It's cog the cognitive process by when someone acts in a violent way. 
hire the jury to be sure of what was in their mind. And also, if you've got a knife, are you, are you, what's the purpose that you've got it for? Is it offensive? Is it defensive? Yeah. Um, so one of the key lessons that we have from a session where we have two uh, main papers and two commentators is that no matter what we do, there's enough to keep us going discussing it for far beyond the time we have. We have this problem where we have three papers, we always have to cut it off at some point, and we're doing the same even when we have two papers. Can we thank our uh, speakers and for this evening?